This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our sunset safari on a blustery, chilly afternoon. It really is quite cold, and luckily, though, this clouds have just split open, and the sun is now shining. It is a very, very warm afternoon also, or well, good afternoon, to the schools that are joining us this afternoon. So, Sandstone and Fair Oaks Elementary from Virginia, wonderful to have both of you with us, and I hope that you're going to have the best time as we explore Africa over the next little bit. Now, now, it is a live interactive safari, which means that I want to hear from all of you. And so remember to ask your teachers all the questions that you've got and they'll send them through to us and we'll try and answer as many as we can. Now, I also need to introduce myself so you know who I am. My name is Tristan, as you probably just saw. And on camera, I've got David. There is his thumb. And so we're going to try and see what we can find this afternoon. Now that the sun has just come out, I'm hoping that maybe, just maybe, we're going to see a situation where some of the ellies might come out. So some elephants might make their way to a water hole just to rehydrate and get some water as well as maybe some of the other animals. We're also going to head towards the eastern side of the reserve and go and see if we can find a very special female leopard that has a cub at the moment. So that's the plan for the afternoon from our side. Hopefully it will be a good one and hopefully we'll be able to find what we're looking for. Now what I'm going to do though is as we're kind of driving I'm going to head along a very very sort of thick area where lots and lots of trees are on a what we call a drainage line which is basically a dry riverbed and it's where water flows during the rainy season and when it's very windy and cold like this you'll often find a lot of the animals particularly things like elephants are going to try and make their way into those thickets just to get out of the wind and so it's a really good place if you're looking for ellies is to drive along those areas so hopefully we'll get quite lucky now I'm not the only one out here this afternoon looking for all kinds of things for you we also have Steve and he's not in a vehicle but he's on his feet Good afternoon boys and girls. How are we all doing this wonderful afternoon or is it morning where you are? I think it might be. My name is Steve. I'm joined on camera by Fergus and we are out in the savanna biome. What is the savanna biome you might ask? It is an area made up of trees and grasses and we are surrounded by it and inside of the biome there are many, many, many ecosystems. I know one of your subjects, subjects is ecosystems and even just a small tree that is pushed over like this is an ecosystem. Can you believe that? The entire area we're in is an ecosystem and just a small little branch fallen down is the ecosystem where you can find all sorts of small and almost invisible organisms and creatures. So there are multitudes and multitudes and multitudes of these ecosystems in and around and we'll see if we can focus a little bit on that as we go. And growing out the tree is actually growing out of a massive big uh, termite mound. This is a very small termite mound, which itself is an ecosystem. The termites have made this out of sand, and I know one of your school's names is sandstone. Um, a lot of the soil we get around here has actually come from sandstone from very far away, and uh, it's a type of so a type of rock. And that sand there is like the bricks we use for building. The termites have used that as well to create their ecosystem inside there. So, Deborah, you want to know where I get all my research from? Well, I spent a lot of time studying, about seven years at university, and then a lot of time here in this. This is my ecosystem, my uh, university as well and living on the land and living out here in the ecosystem is exactly how we learn these things and constantly constantly questioning and walking and experiencing and just over time just gets more and more and more and hopefully we can give you some of that information and so we are out on bushwalk this afternoon we're going to be heading off towards sort of the eastern side to see if we can pick up on any tracks of a female leopard that they were trying to find this morning so we're hoping we'll be able to find that and don't forget to send through your questions with your teacher and we'll see if we can answer them but i'm not the only gentleman out this afternoon sydney is out as well and he's found the remains of a leopard kill A very, very good afternoon to you all. My name is Sydney and I am traveling with Craig. We are going to be with you on this afternoon game drive. 
My plan for this afternoon is very much easy, is to go and look for Hosanna where he was last spotted this morning. And for the questions and comments, you can follow us on Twitter, hashtag Safari Live, and also on YouTube chat stream. So I will be around for your tailor dam and try to see if we can find Hosanna again. With me here, I have got some uh, remains. Eh? I've got some remains from this morning. I can see that uh, Hosanna was very busy trying to eat something. Eh? So I'm going to be looking around here and see if we can find him. I haven't noticed any tracks on the ground yet, but I'm going to do quite a lot of trekking here and see where he's hiding at the moment. I have been looking around this tree and I can see that there is no marks showing that he went somewhere nearby. So, but I'm going to visit all the nearest water holes and see if maybe he went there uh, just to do something. Yeah, it's a little bit windy uh, this afternoon here, yeah, but the wind is not too much. Yeah, we can go to uh, Tristan. He's got some impalas on his side. I do indeed. So I've got one of our most common antelope that we see here in southern Africa and in this part of the wilderness areas of South Africa. These guys are really prolific, which means that they are pretty much everywhere. And they are called an impala, as Sydney said. Now what we've got here is all male impalas, so they're the ones that have all got horns. If it was a female, well, they wouldn't have any horns at all. And you'd find that those sort of big things that grow off their head wouldn't actually be on there in any way whatsoever. So you can always tell boys and girls from one another just by looking on top of their head, which is quite convenient. Now, they are moving off into a thicket. They're trying to probably go and find some food and some semblance of nutrition. And so we're going to let them do so and carry on and see what else we can find. Like I said, there are quite a few different impalas out or herds of impalas out here. So I'm pretty sure we will be able to find lots. In fact, there's another antelope over there. Katie, well, luckily for us, we don't have to worry about actually cleaning the animals and making them healthy because animals, well, they do it all themselves. And so the impala and this nyala that you see over here, they are very, very good at grooming themselves. So what I mean when I say grooming is that these guys will have teeth that are that have ridges on them and very elasticated gums. And that means that the teeth can move apart slightly and they'll then run their teeth through their fur. So I don't know if you've ever had a dog or a cat and you watch that they sometimes will lick their fur. Well, with an antelope, they will use their teeth more than their tongue and they'll comb through their fur and it acts like just like a comb when you brush your hair. It's the same thing and it will pull off all the dust and it'll get rid of any loose hair and it keeps their hair in really good condition. It also helps them get rid of any parasites like ticks, which are little insects basically that get onto the antelope and will feed off their blood. So they don't want any of those about and so they'll try and get those off as well. So the animals are very good at cleaning themselves and making sure that they stay nice and sort of healthy that way. In terms of, of keeping them healthy, well these areas as you can see there's a lot of food for them. They can eat a lot of the leaves and the grasses and then the predators like the cats like the leopard that you saw with Sydney, well he's going to try and catch these animals and so there's always food around for both sides and as long as there's water and food most animals will be able to stay very very healthy indeed right now sorry Megs you just broke up a little bit can you just repeat the name for me I'm just trying to listen to Megan a little bit windy out here Miss Boyce, well, the horns are used mostly for males to establish themselves as dominant males. And so what that means is that these guys will come together and you'll see that there's actually some boys sort of running through in that direction and kind of moving away from us at the moment. They all seem a little bit shy and I think it's because maybe that leopard is in the area. I'm not very far from where Sydney is and so maybe with the wind and the leopard you'll have a situation where they're a bit nervous. But the horns essentially are used for territorial sort of displays. And, and dominance and so what they do is when the males are trying to fight for a territory or an area that they want to dominate and for a female that they are trying to mate with well then they'll clash and they'll use their horns to fight so they kind of come together 
and then they push each other around and they're able to test each other's strength and that's how then a female will know if that male is able to fight all the other males away then he's very strong and he's very good then to be a daddy impala and to be able to then have little babies with him so it's a very clever system to have and, and the horns are good for that the other thing that horns will do is sometimes they can be helpful in terms of a defense so they will try and kind of chase off predators using their horns but it's very seldom that they do that because you know fighting with a predator means that they can sometimes make a mistake and then the predator can grab them and, and kill them so most of the time they won't use the horns for fighting predators but more for fighting one another and you can see this male here he's a young boy because his horns are still very small if you look at the male behind him look at the size of his horns much much bigger and so in impalas you can actually age them and tell how old they are by using their horns as their horns grow and get bigger like that so that makes them more of an adult and so the male that we saw first he's not going to be able to get any girls at all or try and mate in the next sort of mating season he's still too young whereas these guys with the big horns well they're going to be strong enough to try and start competing and trying to start earning their right to be a dominant male as they go forward so it's very good when you see kind of mixed herds like this it just goes to show that the younger boys will learn from the older boys so miss miss west the, the reason why is that basically male antelope are the ones that are fighting for dominance because they don't actively have to try well i mean sorry the females don't actively have to try and fight for dominance because the males will because of their testosterone and the way that they, they drive to mate works, they're going to try and compete as much as possible to get as many females as they can. So that's why they have the horns, is because they compete a lot more. Females simply are there and they will choose and pick and choose the males that fight for it. So you'll find with female antelope, or some of the female antelope, that they do not have horns for that reason. They are not actually fighting and they're not actually competing with one another in order to try and chase each other away and, and secure a male. They would rather wait for the males to come to them. The thing about also with females is a lot of the time they'll form groups together so as they have more eyes and ears to be able to spot predators and so you know there's no need for them to actually fight off more females it helps them to have other females around them rather than with the males you know they are actively trying to chase the, the male other males away in order to secure as many females as possible but you will find some species of antelope the, the female does have horns so if you look at things like a wildebeest the female will have horns um, and the reason for that is not really sure they not don't really know they think it's because the female in that particular situation often has to try and protect its young and so it will use those horns to try and chase off sort of things like jackals and and um, hyenas and those kind of animals but very cool to see them these guys are a little bit more relaxed which is quite nice it's always nice to see a few antelope that are sort of posing in the afternoon sunlight good well we're going to carry on we're going to see what else we can find we'll see if we can find some ellies along here it seems as though our plan of driving these thickets is working so far and so while we carry on doing that it sounds like steve has found himself a piece of wood yes well we are out on bushwalk as i said and on bushwalk we like to look at the smaller things and what we have spotted here out in the sort of dry riverbed we're approaching the dry riverbed anyway it's a very good area to look for leopards and to look for elephants just like what sydney was doing and what tristan was suggesting what we've spotted looks to be a spider i don't know if it's alive but inside there is the spider's little ecosystem ecosystems don't have to be enormous ecosystem can be in the entire ocean it can be an entire mountaintop or it can just be your shoe that you leave outside for too long. Wow, Miss Boyce, you want to know how many ecosystems in this area? There are more than I could count. I mean, we could look at the broad ecosystems. We could look at the, the watering holes as one. We could look at the, the rivers as two. We look at the dry rivers as three. We could look at the tree line along the dry rivers as four. We could look at the, the, the top of the slopes as five. You could, but then within each of those is smaller ones. Like here, we've just got a piece of wood. And inside the wood is an ecosystem. Um, what we're going to be looking for shortly is some elephants, I reckon, because it's a nice area for looking for elephants. And when we find you a pile of elephant dung, that in itself is an ecosystem. Oh, there's some over there. Some scratched up elephant 
Ooh. We've spotted an elephant. Just through there, on the other side of the drainage. We're going to see we're going to see if we can maybe get a little bit of a better view. But on bushwalk, the objective is not to really get the best view of these animals. It's to remain safe and to view the animals safely without causing them any negative behavior. So let's just sneak behind this bush, see if Ferg can get a look at it there. Have you got a view, Ferg? Can you see him, Ferg? Very, very small sight of the, the largest land mammal. And it occurs right here. Normally there's more than one. If there's only one, then it's probably a male. I can't quite see it yet, so we're just going to move to surround this bush a little bit. Just a little bit, see if we can get a better view. There we go, just do there. Haley, you want to know how an elephant protects itself? I'm being very quiet so that don't disturb it in any way. How they protect themselves? Well, they're very big, first of all, Haley. so most things leave them alone. But if they get threatened, they can. They can basically stamp on something and flatten it with their enormous weight. They've also got very big tusks that are growing out of the face that are also used for fighting and for defense. But most animals learn just to leave them alone. We're going to go a little bit further forward there. There's a nice log we can crouch down behind. Come along. We're going to keep very quiet. And we're going to be very quiet and slow. It's very exciting to see elephants. There we go, Ferg. Just one at the moment. But, but the vegetation is very thick over here. You could probably have an entire herd of elephants. You wouldn't even know. You'd have to listen. But let's have a look. Hello, Wayne. You want to know how elephants move and walk? Well, they've got four legs. So they basically just move each leg at a time, similar to most animals will do. But they walk very slowly. They don't really have the ability to run. But they can walk very quickly. But look at that. It's got its trunk up. That is a male. It's on his own. You can see those tusks I was talking about. He's using that trunk, which is actually a very long extension of his nose, to grab the branches and the leaves and then stick them inside of his mouth. And there, you want to know what they use their trunk for? They use it for absolutely everything. They suck up water, which they then pour down their throat. They breathe with it. They trumpet with it. They smell all sorts of things. They use it for touching each other, for guiding their youngsters. Uh, they use it for picking up dust and spraying it on their bodies, picking up mud, spraying it on their bodies. They use it for for picking up leaves, branches, fruits, for pulling branches down, for breaking branches. Their trunk is very, very useful. They use it for almost everything. Very, very cool. A one male elephant seemingly on his own in the sort of dry river depression here. This is the perfect area to find elephants because there's lots of leaves. We low down so there's water for the plants. They're nice and green. And the elephant has the ability to feed on all of the plant parts. The, they can push over the tree and feed on the roots. It can rip down the branches from high up and eat them. It can also use its tusks to dig into the bark and rip the bark off. Because all of these plants have got lots of nutrients and some of them have got lots and lots of sort of me medical value. Well, this is about as close as you're going to get to an elephant on foot, but Tristan seems to have found some in the vehicle.
I have indeed, Steve. I've also found myself a lonely young male elephant that is, well, doing what elephants do best and is having a good afternoon feed. I'm pretty sure this Ellie is quite happy that the sun is out and it's kind of just walking along pretty much where we thought they would be, kind of just moving and trying to find all kinds of little things to eat. Now, elephants are very interesting in that they are very selective about what they feed on. Even though they're such big animals and they have to eat a lot of food in a day, you'll find that they are very, very careful about what they eat. They like to find their favorite kind of meals. And so even though he's got his trunk down to the ground and looks like he's just pulling up little bits of anything, it's not actually the case. He's using his trunk to sniff around and have a look at the sort of, well, try to smell out the certain sort of plants that he's looking for. And he's going to try and find the new tiny little little plants that are growing because those are going to be the most nutritious in this time of the year. Now in winter the grass is very dry and dead and so it's not his favorite kind of food. So he's looking more for little plants that are growing there. Anything with a bit of greenery on it is generally a little bit more tasty than the dry wintry grass. Uh, ah, Jamira, you are very clever because you've noticed that an elephant has very, very large ears and that there must be a reason for it. Now, there is a reason that elephants have big ears. There's two very important reasons. One is that it's a very good tool to be able to hear with. Now, that elephant's got his back to us, and so we can't really see nicely, but on the side of their head, there is an eardrum, and you can see just in front of where the ear is at the moment, there's a little hole there, and that's where the sound goes in. And so when an elephant wants to hear better, it pushes its ear forward, and that's able to act like a big satellite dish that's able to catch all the sound. Now, I want you to sit in the classroom and I want you to put your hand next to your ear when I'm talking. So go like this and put your hand like this and just listen at how much louder it sounds when your hand is over your ear like this. And that's exactly the same thing for the elephant. When it's closed like this, it doesn't help that much. But as it comes forward, it's able to catch a lot more sound and they can hear a lot better better. So that's one reason why they have a very big ear. The second reason is to help with keeping their body nice and cool. Now with those big ears on the back of them, can you see there's a few veins there? You see those little sort of stripes on the ear? Now those are veins that are filled with blood. And so as this elephant flaps its ears, it's pulling wind over those veins and the skin is very very thin so the blood gets cooled quite quickly and then the cooler blood can go back into the body and it actually works very much like a radiator of a car so when you drive your car the wind coming through the front of the car is actually cooling it down and keeping the engine nice and cool it's the same for an elephant and they reckon that this is the most efficient cooling system in nature which basically means it's the best way to cool themselves out of any of the animals that we have and they have to have that because it is a very big animal and in Africa it can get very hot. Today is cold but in the summer months we can get temperatures over 120 degrees Fahrenheit and because they're so big the sun then hits them a lot and so they have to have a way to try and cool their body down very quickly and that's how they do it. So they flap their ears and the wind will just cool the blood in the veins and send the cooler blood back into the body. Very clever isn't it? It's an amazing thing that they're able to use. Now you can see with this elephant you would think that they're very easy to see but actually you can see how well it camouflages in that area. It really is quite tough actually to see them sometimes. So we have to keep our eyes peeled and hope maybe there's some more around with little babies but while we do that Sydney has found what he is looking for and now you are going to see the most beautiful animal in my opinion in the world. No, it was a very interesting story about how the elephants get camouflaged. Now I have got uh, Hosanna. Shortly after we have seen the kill, I was doing a lot of investigations in the area to try and get hold of his tracks, but suddenly I won the battle. Here comes Hosanna. You can see he's lying down there, very relaxed, completely asleep. So the cats, after having a meal, this is what they do. So they've got to come and lie down for some long hours. And now listen, my favorite animal is the dung beetle. Remember, insects are also part of the animal kingdom, eh? 
uh, insect is just a class. My favorite animal is the dung beetle. But my favorite mammal is the rhino. Whereas my favorite cat is the lion. So you can see that um, Osana is not worried about anything here and no competition, nothing. Earlier on, we saw the kill. The kill was the remains of the kill is hanged up by the tree. I don't think he will go back there in order to finish the rest because it was just a little bit of some of the meat left. So. Yeah, we can uh, now go to uh, uh, Steve. He's got some elephants to show us on the other side. Yes, well, we're still with this elephant, and there's more than one now, it appears. But I'd like to introduce you to my friend. This is Herbie. He's out on a walk with us. He gives a bit of assistance with security. He's a very good friend of mine. We're here on a log, enjoying watching this elephant eat. He's very relaxed, just feeding. You can't see the rest, they're kind of down in the drainage depression, the dry riverbed, moving slowly towards the left where there's a watering hole. Hello Stephen, you want to know why they eat so many leaves? Well Stephen, they've got to feed on a big male elephant, it's got to feed on about 600 pounds of wet food a day. 600, can you imagine? So they're just eating all the time, all the time, eating for 18 to 20 hours every day. They don't stop. That's crazy. Can you imagine your jaw muscles? You have some really strong jaw muscles. That's just the way it is. The elephants, they've got a very bad digestive system. They don't break down their food very well. So they've got to eat lots and lots and lots of food. They disappeared. Ella, you want to know how they pick their favorite food? Well, how do you pick your favorite food? You smell it? Yes. And then you taste it? Yes. Well, elephants have got an amazing ability to smell, and they know exactly what they want. They can smell everything, and they go, Ooh, I know, I like that, I like that. They just pick what they want. They're very selective with that long trunk. Can move around, they can grab whatever they want to. So they'll go out, they'll pick exactly what they want, and they're also very clever. So they learn from their mothers, from their grandmothers, and as they get older and older and older, they learn where to go, how to get the right food, and when's the best time to eat things or when things are coming up. So they will choose exactly what they want to, just like we do. We eat what we want to because we can. Elephants do what they can, no one tells them what to do. Okay, well, we seem to have lost sight of these elephants, so we might continue on back along this way, get back to that side, and uh, leave them onto their feeding. But what is very interesting is they're heading directly in the direction where Sydney has got that leopard, so there might be some fun and games yet to play. Yeah, after such a fantastic sighting of the elephants, we are back again. I have got Hosanna here. If you look at the stomach, you can see that Hosanna ate a lot this morning. Eh? And that is one of the reasons why Hosanna is sleeping now. So the cats, they need a lot of time for digestion. But it's not going to wake up and go and hunt again. So they are going to spend is going to spend some time it's going to take a couple of days before hunting activities begins again so i'm just trying to look there on the front legs yeah i've got a question from uh steven uh yes the cheetahs and the lepers they are not similar the cheetahs and lepers, there is quite a very big difference between the two. If you look at the body size, the cheetahs are much more thinner than the lepers. And again, when looking at the face, the cheetahs, they have got some kind of tear marks. It's like the cheetah has been crying all day long. So the leopard don't have the tear mark. 
and the cheetahs as well, the head is too small. Leopard has got a very big head. And on the ground as well, where the cheetah has gone past is completely different from where the leopard has gone past. If you look at their nails, the cheetahs, they don't, uh, they don't restrict back their, their nails. Whereas the leopards, they can be able to retreat their, their nails. So the ground track for a leopard, you won't see the nail marks unless he, 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 he brought them out in order to do something or in order to grab when he's running. So you can see that he's, he's not that very far away from where I am, but he's not concentrating on anything. All he's doing is just sleeping and enjoying. Uh, uh, Georgie, when I'm doing these kind of activities, I am not afraid of anything I'm used to. I feel like I'm part of this natural system because I always treat these animals with all respect. So, but now where we are, the distance between us and this leopard, it is quite a very comfortable zone. So this leopard cannot have problems with me here where I am now. So I'm just going to uh, wait here and wait. There is a question from uh, uh, Jamila. Uh, Jamila, the reason why the big cats eat, eat the antelopes is that the antelopes, they can tend to become an easy meal. If you look, for example, let's use an impala or the kudu as an example. If you check a group of cats against that animal, it's very easy to catch it. But if you check the big animals, they are big in size and they're also very dangerous. Cats, yes, they've got an ability to hunt, but the chances of them getting injured during hunting activities are also very high and these cats they tend to feed on these antelopes because they saw that the antelopes they don't have much greater chance to defend themselves so if, if you look at the the spots you can see that it's very much difficult unless you are you are used to see these animals hiding. You can easily go past these animals sleeping there because it's very much camouflaged. You can see that kind of yellowish is matching the surrounding. It's matching the, the grasses uh, by the surrounding. Yeah, now uh, we can now go to Tristan. He is going to uh, show you some small antelopes, which is one of the meals uh, considered by the cats. Well, it's just gone behind that bush, but it is a meal that Hosanna was eating last night and this morning. You can see it moving very sort of carefully behind that bush. There it goes. It's called a daker. Now, a daker is a very small antelope. It's, in fact, the second smallest antelope that we see in this part of South Africa, and they are fully grown at that size. Now, that size is probably, I would say, about the size of a smallish dog, so something like a Staffordshire Terrier or something like that. It would be about that size. So they are quite small, and normally you find them in pairs together. So there's normally a male and a female. That was a little female that we saw kind of just going out into the thicket, and so maybe the male is here. We're going to just try and have a little look. We'll go around the corner and see if I can just get a better view of it as well as we go. But they are quite common in this area, and their name basically refers to a diver. That's what a diker means in Afrikaans, and it's because if they jump into the bush. Now, sorry, Megs, if you can just please repeat that for me again. Sorry, I just broke up a little bit. Ah, 
Jordan, it depends on the animal, but baby animals can be seen pretty much any time of the year amongst all the different animals, but in t the antelope species, so things like the impala that we saw earlier, and the nyala and this diker, well, they only are going to breed generally during the summer months. And the reason why they breed during the summer months is because there's a lot more food in summer and a lot more cover that they can hide in. So much better for them to have their little babies in summer where they can find food and shelter and all of these kind of things. Things like the elephant and, and the leopard, like you saw with Sydney and, and Steve, they will breed at any time time of the year because well elephants are very good at finding food and they can dig and they can try and kind of move long distances in order to find food and that means that they generally can find it at any time of the year and something like a leopard well it can catch animals at any time as well so they have their babies at any time of the year but normally most of the babies in the antelope world are born around our September October November December into January February that's kind of when we have all of them which is our summer months here in the southern Africa so opposite to you guys you guys are all in your summer now whereas we are in our cold winter and so you know our babies only really come lots of babies only really come around the sort of summer period later in the year for us it's a time of, of, it's a really nice time to be out here because you get to see all the little baby antelopes and you see them kind of running around and they've always got lots of energy so it's a beautiful time to be in South Africa or in the southern part of Africa and get to see a lot of really cool things when the little babies are around and sometimes you even get lucky and you can actually even see the baby being born which is very special. Right, well, I'm going to continue to see what else I can find. Maybe we can find some other animals to show you while we do that, though. Steve is still walking around, and I wonder what interesting things he's going to show you next. Yes, well, we moved out of that river, dry river, because it seemed like there were more elephants than we first anticipated. And it's very windy today. Wind makes elephants a little bit jumpy. It makes most animals jumpy, actually. So we moved out and we've come a little bit more open into the open. And what Fergus is showing you now is a very nice termite mound. And we had a whole lot of small mammals that ran in there. I'm not sure if we can see any at the moment, but the smallest carnivore that we get in the area called the dwarf mongoose. Here we go. Did you get him? Okay, well, a couple of them just ran on the side there, and they like to live, they like to live in these termite mounds. You see, it's a really big sort of bit of earth that's been created out of the sand by termites that, that feed on grass, and uh, they recycle all the nutrients back into the soil. So not only are they doing a very important thing for the environment, they make these really big apartment blocks that some animals come along and like to live inside. Here we go. Oh, look at them. They're popping out. <laughs> so lots and lots of termite mounds in these areas. Um, and lots and lots of small animals like to live inside them. The dwarf mongoose is only one. And uh, we get an animal around called the aardvark, which is also known as an ant bear. And they feed on termites. And they dig into these burrows looking for food and by doing that they allow access to this really really big sort of apartment block hotel you could call it where they are protected against sort of larger predators such as the leopard you saw before and also from certain snakes and eagles and owls so very very important for the area Hello, Deborah. You'd like to know what the rarest animal I've ever seen is? Well, I'm going to have to show you a picture because it, we're not going to find you one because, as we have discussed, it is very rare. It is the pangolin. It is almost like an armadillo. Once Ferg has shown you the termite mound and comes back, I'll be able to show you the picture. And there we go. There is the pangolin over there. Kind of like an armadillo. And they are, were widespread all across Africa, but they are really, really disappearing because of people and poaching, which is very, very sad. Very, very sad. I've only ever seen one of them before, and that was all the way over there in Namibia, on the west side of South Africa, west and north. We, by the way, are all the way over here, just in the corner there, 
where the red is. That is where we are. Well, this is southern Africa. And we're in the northeast of South Africa. In a place called the Sabi Sands. Okay, well we're going to continue and see what else we can find in the way of ecosystems. And Sydney is still with that sleeping cat. Yeah, it was a very interesting topic about the termites, the importance of termites. And now I am still here by um, uh, Hosanna. You know, Hosanna, this is my first encounter with the leopard Hosanna since my arrival here in Juma. So it's quite uh, very interesting to come across Hosanna for the first time. So now I am able to identify quite a few of these leopards in Juma. So you can see not much activities are taking place. Yeah, there is a question uh, from Haley. Uh, the, the dangerous animal, a meat eater, from my side, uh, from my own observation and experience, is the leopard. Yes, big cats such as the lions, they walk in groups, we have seen them hunting, but when you are doing these kind of activities, guided walks, the leopard is so very much silent, eh? and you can easily come come across them too close, not knowing that they are there. But lions, they are easily noticeable. So the leopards, uh, from my experience, tend to be the most dangerous one on food specifically. So these leopards remind me of where I come from. While I was still very young, we used to encounter these kind of animals in the wild. Yeah? Until today, there is still quite a lot of leopards sightings recorded in around Venda area, Venda land. And even the black leopards. We even got a soccer team. Sometimes this soccer team goes up to the Premier Soccer League and the name is a leopard. This leopard team the name derived from the black leopards that used to be spotted in that area some years ago uh, i didn't get the name of the viewer who asked the question about uh, my experience in the wild. I have been involved in this kind of activity. So, Vona, I have been involved with this kind of activity since two th the beginning of 2007. So I first work by one of the private farms, which is uh, between Gauteng and, uh, and, and it's, it's between Gauteng and Bela Bela, which is in Limpopo. It's called the Mabula Game Lodge. I worked there from 2007 until 2009. Then the beginning of 2009, I was then headhunted by the South African National Parks, whereby I was based in Marakele National Park, which is one of the national parks in Limpopo province of South Africa. After that, I left, and that is where I came to join the World the, the Wild Earth team here in Juma. Yeah, let's now go to Steve. Thanks, Sydney. Hopefully, Hosanna gets up soon and gives us some action. But anyway, in the meantime, I did tell you, boys and girls, I was going to hopefully show you another ecosystem before you depart. And we have found one right here. And it is in an enormous pile of elephant poo. And this is an ecosystem on its own. And why I say that is because it is dung for the elephant, food for other animals, meaning there's lots of grass still in there, lots of vegetation. Here you can see there's bark from the sticks, there's leaves in there. But if I had to lift this up, are you ready for it? If I lift this up, there's going to be, look at that, 
termites underneath, a whole ecosystem in its own. So what is actually going to happen is the termites come in from the bottom, they start breaking down this elephant dung, and they're creating all sorts of homes once again. You see all the, the alleyways and compartments? And they break down this dung, turning it back into soil. But at the same time, there's millions and millions of little organisms living inside because the termites are making, as I said, the hotel available for everything to do their thing. But what's very important is I've kind of disturbed this. I'm just going to put it right back there where it belongs. And that the elephants have taken from the grass, from the trees, and the termites and all the other organisms are going to turn that back into soil and nutrients, which is then going to come back into the vegetation, the grass and the trees. So very, very important to make note of that. So, Fair Oaks and Sandstone Elementaries, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We hope to see you again very, very soon. Make sure you do your homework. Have a beautiful day further, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. And on that note, sorry, we are going to be going back over to Sydney, who is still with the sleeping Osana. Osana is very much relaxed at the moment and no other activities are taking place except having a sleep. So I'm just waiting here to see if maybe it's gonna wake up and try to go back to uh, the tree, the tree which is hosting the prey because there's just a little bit of remains left there. Not too sure if he will go back to those uh, remains or else he will carry on. So these animals, the cats, sometimes it's very difficult to see, to see if they've got a kill because they are one of those animals that spend much of their time cleaning themselves. So after a kill, you see them trying to lick their front legs, taking off the blood and, and everything there. So now from this one, I haven't seen any, any sign that this animal is from a fresh kill. It's just very clean, very clean. So no other animals are coming to this area where we are. It is very much quiet. It seems like the other grazers knows about the presence of Osana in this area. He has been here anyway since this morning, eh? But I nearly missed this leopard, eh? Because of matching the surrounding. Because I went past here and I didn't notice anything until I picked up the tracks, which confirmed that he is here because the tracks were very much fresh. If it, if it was not because of the tracks, I was definitely not going to find this leopard this afternoon. Uh, there is a question from Chartman. The leopards, when they get up to cats mostly, when they get up to 18 to uh, 22 months, let me say two years and above, that is when they reach maturity and then they start to breed. So you will see when they, uh, the, the young stars, the young males are growing, soon as they become strong, also to defend themselves they get they, they then leave the families they then leave the the groups and go and be by themselves remember leopards are very much solitary uh, it's, it's lucky to see them walking together So if you can check these animals, uh, I've got a question from Sina. I didn't get that question very well. If you FC, you can repeat the question again.
I did. I still did not get uh, the question nicely, but I hear that it's about the leopard killing the hyenas. These kind of predators, when there is a kill on the ground, I thank you very much for um, giving me the question again, FC, uh, the Final Control Office. The leopards, they drag this animal up into the tree. Yes, the smell of the blood in the area can easily attract the hyenas. It's just that leopards are too clever because they manage to drag it up to, to avoid the scavengers such as hyenas to come and deprive the meat. So the hyenas, even if they can get the information from the wind, because hyenas can be able to smell distances of approximately four kilometers. They can be able to smell the dead, the dead carcass. So that gives us a sign that from a long distance, hyenas can be able to smell. Even if they can smell these carcass, the chances are zero percent for those hyenas to get anything from this carcass because it's high up. And remember, the hyenas are one of those animals that are not well equipped when it comes to the features of being able to climb up the trees to get hold of the carcasses. Yeah, now we can go to Steve. Uh, Steve has got uh, something to show us from the trees. Yes, well, hello, everybody. It's me again, and welcome back to all of the Internet viewers. Don't forget to send your questions at hashtag Safari Live or follow us in the YouTube stream. It is Monday, as you know, and um, I will be conducting a little bit of a medicinal Monday in a short period of time, and Fergus is busy framing up the tree that we're going to be doing so I wonder if any of you out there who knows your trees very well even if you don't give it a stab send to your one word tweet I suppose what tree is this and uh, those of you who've been watching the show for the last few days or the last show I did before going and leave will know because I told you what tree I was going to be doing today and if you didn't know then hopefully you, you've seen what we're looking at and send to to hide the branch behind. We're going to set up shortly and get a whole lot of stuff going for a very interesting 20 minutes or so, half hour of medicinal magic on a Monday, again in the afternoon this time. I know um, it is quite windy, so the animals are all just making themselves very scarce. So we'll add some value to this afternoon while Tristan is out in the east busy tracking. Michelle, well done, 100% correct on your answer there, but which cluster leaf? Which cluster leaf? Hmm. It is indeed a cluster leaf, and those of you who've spent time with us here know that we've only really shown you the one cluster leaf, and um, I don't know if I've actually seen the second cluster leaf in this area. There's a very nice band of them over here growing through. They're a very nice grove, and they, most of them are losing the leaves. So I'm trying to find a couple of leaves for the setup. I've got a bag full of interesting things that I've already collected. Giraffe girl, yes, indeed, it is a silver cluster leaf, and we have actually seen giraffe feeding on the pods. Um, I thought maybe I saw them feeding on the leaves once, but it was most certainly the pods. And these are the pods here. See how useful my stick is, which I found, by the way. Now the pods, going to need some of them for some decoration. There we go. They are normally a, a lot different, in, sorry, a lot different in color, but they are aging now. They've gone very dry and very brown, and uh, the brown-headed parrots are absolutely loving these seeds. That's why we're seeing or hearing a lot of brown-headed parrots around. Um, not many other birds are able to physically break open these pods to eat on them. Let me, let me show you how tough they are. I'm going to use my teeth. Very dry. To get inside there, it's almost, it's almost impossible. 
I don't have the mechanisms. Excuse me for spitting. I don't have the mechanisms. It's a very hard seed, which the parrots do very, very well at opening. But we can actually take these and we can dry quite a few of them and we can roast them and we can use this as a substitute for coffee. Uh, apparently it tastes a little bit better than uh, the instant coffee that you normally get or a little bit worse. I'm not quite sure. I've tried it once and it ended up all going a little bit off. So I never actually got to the point of drinking the stuff. But um, I found it much easier just to use local stuff or, or pre-bought stuff. It's not very flavorful. Most of the plant is very bitter, very distasteful. And, um, well, we're going to show you in a little while exactly why. Okay, well, it seems like Tristan is back on the vehicle, and I believe he's got some tracks to show you. I am indeed, and I have found what I was looking for, and that is the tracks of what I think is Tundi and Kalamba that have come out of Torchwood and are going back into Juma, which is good news. The tracks themselves are not exactly the freshest tracks, and not tracks from during the day today they look like they're from last night and are quite windswept which we know could mean that she's very far from where we are now but at least it's an indication and a clue as to where she kind of walked and hopefully if we just keep following them we might be getting lucky or we might get lucky and find her somewhere around this area so I want to just sort of go around quickly past Central and down Drakensberg and see if she crosses those roads and where she heads from there she kind of came from the south from Mumba side and then came up this way and then she met with Kalamba here in front of us, so there's a bit of a disturbance in this middle area. Unfortunately, quite a few cars drove here during this morning, so they've sort of driven over a lot of the tracks. But you can see all this area here that's disturbed, that's all tracks for where Tandi and the little one were playing around in the middle of the road. And if you look just slightly to the left, I've made a big circle, so that area there, that's where little Kalamba went off the road. She went into this thicket over there, and then Tandi came back down the road towards us, and then into this mitre drain, and she went off that way. So the two of them were having a good time in this general vicinity. But like I said, it was last night or early, early, early this morning, and so we'll try and see where they've gone. The wind has really kind of destroyed these tracks, and so it's going to be difficult to kind of see them if they go onto a hard road like Mamba or Central, but let's have a look. We'll, we'll give it a bash and see. Maybe we get lucky, and at least one of them is still around. But nice to see. I, I mean, it's always good when you get tracks. It always lifts one's spirits and makes you kind of look at that much harder, and so hopefully it's going to be a good sign of the sort of things that are going to happen this afternoon. I'm pretty stoked for, or happy for Sydney that he finally gets to meet the little prince and, and for Ralph this morning because I, I chatted to Ralph yesterday and he said that he hadn't really spent any time with Hosanna so it's really nice for the two of them or well, one to meet Hosanna and the other one to actually get to know him a little bit better because he's such a special cat that you know it really is a special thing to actually spend some time around him so as much as James and I are chomping at the bit to try and get a sort of long sighting of Hosanna it's really nice for the new guys to to get to know him a little bit better and really get to spend some time with him so I'm thoroughly thrilled that he managed to kill the dike at the camp and that he's still in that area so proud cat mama it depends on on where you are and densities of of other predators but generally the average sort of lifespan of a leopard in the wild will be about 12 to 13 years for a male and about roughly about 14 to 16 for a female if you kind of look at most areas so here in the Sabi sands that's mostly what we see we'll see the males normally 12 13 years old whereas females generally 14 15 sometimes 16 it's it's not that common to you know to get past that there are a few females in the sabi sands that have gotten past that age but it's not that common at all so you know we'll just it, you get lucky if you get them getting older than that and remember there was a female in this area in fact part of this whole lineage of tundis and hosanas and which was safari and she was went over 19 which is pretty insane when you think about it i remember seeing her i was actually funny enough the last person to see her in a sighting she was not seen again after that but she, the time that we did see her that last time she really was in bad condition she had this 
basically just sort of bone structure with skin draped over her, this really bad eye, and so it was quite heartbreaking to actually see her in that condition. But at 19 and a half years old, you know, can't really blame her for being the way that she was, and the fact that she survived that long in such a leopard dense area was a testament to her skill as a, as a leopard. She was really quite phenomenal to follow, and in her sort of younger years, she was from what I gather from many of the trackers, I mean, I didn't see her when she was, you know, a 10-year-old leopardess or, was, you know, sort of 8 to 12 when they're in their prime, but she apparently was absolutely phenomenal. So, you know, it's it just the lineage and the stock that Hosanna and Tandi and all of them come from are, is very, very good, and hopefully one of them will also live to a long, long age like that. We know, obviously, Shadow is gone, um, Shavinzi gone, Shongile presumably gone and so Tandi's the last hope in terms of the female line to try and kind of you know go to a very old age and now obviously Klalamba is the next one that's kind of got to go and, and try and continue and, and sort of keep the baton alive for that lineage because the rest of them unfortunately are all boys and even Shadow you know she didn't produce any little females that have survived and so it's little Klalamba Raya is resting all the hopes are resting on her to kind of continue Safari and Karula's bloodline going forward, which is pretty scary when you think about it. You, you think that that could potentially be the end of the bloodline if little Klalamba doesn't survive. It would be quite sad to think that if, if you know, you, I suppose it, I say the end of the bloodline, but the end of the sort of female side of the bloodline rather than the male side. You know, the males obviously distribute out and they will carry those genes, but it's not the same as the kind of females within the same area that sort of have all of these daughters and granddaughters and it continues through in the same sort of area of the reserve. Now, I'm just driving very, very slowly because, well, I'm hoping that the tracks theoretically should come out in this general vicinity. They should have come out somewhere in front of me here. So I'm going to have a little look for them and see if they do come out while we do that. And talking about all of these lineages and these individual leopards, let's go back across to a very sleepy Osana. After interesting stories uh, about the leopards from my colleague on the other side, I am now still here waiting for something to happen. You can see there is a little bit of movement taking place, but I, it's not convincing that Hosanna is going to wake up now and do something. So what I'm going to do now is that I am going to be heading up to Buffalo's Hook Dam and see if there's any other activities taking place. Uh, running about quarter to somewhere five o'clock when the sun is cooling, when it's getting chilly a bit, I will come back here and see if there's any developments. So uh, I can see that There is a question from Nat about the predators. Yeah, the predators, they go sometimes and have water by the water holes. After having water, they go and rest. Their intention mostly by the water hole is not to hunt. They go there just to rest after because they drink a lot of water there and their stomachs are full. So they've got to rest a little bit for the water to get transported in their body. So they will go there and rest. So it's just that it is uh, like hitting birds to uh, hitting one, uh, two birds with one stone. Coincidentally, when they go for drinking, they find other animals coming to drink as well. And when resting the animals come to drink, yes, they catch them. But if the predators were using the water hole for hunting purposes, it was going to be easy for me every day to find predators because all I was going to do, I was going to go and stand by the water hole and see what were the predators coming.
Yeah, so now um, let's go to Buffalo Swook Dam. Maybe we're going to find something interesting on the other side. I will come back here later on because I can see and I know very well, I'm convinced that this animal, the stomach is full. And when the stomach is full like this, it needs quite a lot of rest. So it's going to rest maybe soon as before the sun goes down, he might go up to that tree again. So we'll come back and see if we can find it. See how I'm gonna to here. So you, you can see that now I am pulling out, but still, when I'm looking at uh, Hosanna, I am not seeing anything taking place there. So now let's go to Tristan. Maybe he's going to find something. Well, I hope so too. Sydney so, yeah, is I'm desperately hoping that I will find something this afternoon. Otherwise, it's going to be a fairly long afternoon in this breezy, wintry weather. But so far, no sign of the tracks coming out, which is, I suppose, fairly good news. And maybe she's still lying down inside here, and just they, the two of them are resting. I'm, I, that's what I'm hoping for. There is just a lot of vehicles that have driven around here, and so it's very possible that, unfortunately, the tracks have been driven over, and I might have missed them. But I've gone very slowly, and I've been just checking the sort of verge of the road in the hopes that I'll pick up a track kind of going off on the sides. I did check Batelier Road, nothing there, so I'm going to go back to the last track on the mitre drain and maybe either follow with the vehicle or try and do a little bit of walking around there and just see if I get lucky and maybe find where they've actually gone. It might be that they've crossed the road, like I say, and I've just missed the tracks with the vehicles that have gone up and down. It's definitely not tracks that are from this afternoon. Um, the amount of wind sort of damage to them and the house sort of what would it say obscured the edges have become you know it would tend to indicate that they were from earlier today it's been so windy the last two days that you know any track looks a bit blown and a bit sort of rough around the edges if you had to say it like that so hopefully we'll find something it's it's going to be a sort of tough afternoon otherwise as the weather is not ideal for sort of game viewing when it gets windy like this a lot of the animals just seek shelter and kind of tuck up and rest and so hopefully what we'll get is the wind dying down this afternoon much later and then we can kind of see things coming out but good we're going to try and get onto those tracks while I do that let's send you back across to Steve and see how his terminalia sort of Monday is going yeah, well, thanks very much, Tristan. We mentioned giraffe just moments before, and there we go. Fergus spotted some in the very far distance. How beautiful are they? Not looking too skittish with the wind. They're very far away, though. Good effort keeping it steady there, Ferg. And we do have most of what I wanted to do set up and ready for you. I've got Herbie working on the side, making a little bit of something-something for the ladies. He's making something special for the ladies in FC, and we've decided to hide ourselves from the wind by using a small man-made structure around us where they do the bush braai. And here is the medicinal Mondays for today set up, Terminalia sericea being the plant, and here is a branch. It is not the best branch in the world. The plants are losing lots of leaves, but it is a traditional belief that if you take this branch and you thrust it into the floor of a shrine in your home, that it will produce good crops for that year. I'm not able to thrust it into the ground right now, but I'm going to put it down there. So that is a belief. Is it sort of like a, you'll produce good crops for the year, but it's a very bad luck. It'll produce thunderstorms if you cut down the whole tree. So these traditional things are very, very important to pay attention to. And uh, seeing as we're talking about medicinal plants, it's also important to pay attention to the fact that not all of this can be tried at home. And I don't suggest going out and chopping yourselves down some terminalia and eating it and ingesting it for whatever ailments you might have. Just have a listen and see if you think anything is interesting and leave it at that. Okay, so what I've done is I've harvested some roots. A, um, an elephant pushed over a terminalia and I managed to get a number of the roots, the bark of the roots off. And that was very cool for me because the elephant damaged the tree itself. I, wasn't, I didn't need to damage it and I stripped off some of this bark. And the bark is very powdery. It's very, very interesting. If I show you this, if you can you see it, Ferg? 
when I just do that. All this powder comes off. And I'll demonstrate for you. I've got my own little grinding stone. And I've put it on here. And it actually breaks down very, very well. And I've obviously made some beforehand. Here is some of the stuff that I chopped up. It's very flaky. It's very powdery. And then here is the powder itself that I sifted out of that. And these are the three ingredients we're going to be using today. The leaves are not really used for any medicinal stuff. So first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to make a decoction. I've got the water boiling over here. I'm going to take the bark that I've chopped up and I'm going to put it in there. Make a decoction. A decoction is something that you will steep in boiling water for about 8 to 10 minutes. Give it a little bit of a stir. Oopsie, don't fall off there. 8 to 10 minutes to kind of get that all brewing. And um, we'll talk about exactly what that can do in a little while. But with the powder itself, so let's just get that up and boiling. With the powder itself, this is very, very interesting because what's been used for this is you can make lots of tonics out of the powder. I'm going to make a tonic. Now, a tonic is not necessarily something you will boil up. It's something that you might just use with sort of cool cool water or you can put boiling water with it and then let it cool down maybe add some ice or or let it cool down and just drink it cold and so I'm going to make a tonic as well in the meantime while we wait I'm going to put that all that powder in there that took quite a little while to make and I've got some more hot water I'm just going to add a little bit to it because Ferg is the one who's going to be drinking this in a little while he's laughing he, he's laughing and I'm going to stir that as well to make this very nice tonic and just let that sit okay and we're going to get some lovely colors now the terminalia is extremely bitter uh, you've all seen what happens when we take these leaves and we eat them not very nice but what the leaves have been used for let me just put a lid on on my little tonic over here and what the leaves have been used for is that the Twanas, which is a tribe from the north, they will actually take these and pottery that they might have produced. I know this is not a pottery here, but they actually use the, the silver off of this leaf and they rub it and rub it and actually gives the pottery a silver glazing, which is a very nice sort of way to make your pot stand out from the average brown mud. So it's not really doing too much to this rock. But it's something very well known for the Twana people. Uh, Botswana is also full of people who speak the language of Twana. And that's something they did with the leaves. So while we wait for all my things to brew and to cleanse themselves, we're going to go up to Sydney, who seems to have found something. I've got something very interesting to show you here. Let me just uh, get off the vehicle and move towards this very beautiful tree here and show you what I am going to find. This is one of the very much interesting trees. I am very much interested in this kind of trees because they they've got quite a lot of stories to talk about this is the tree i'm going to use it as an example in order to explain to you how it works when it comes to the trees during the dry season so now by the winter season the trees they've got to rest we sleep during the night and wake up early in the morning same applies to the animals a lot of them they go to sleep during the night and wake up in the morning but some of them they sleep during the day so the trees they've got to go and sleep just by the beginning of autumn to the end, to the, to the beginning of uh, spring the reason why they do that is that they are trying to suspend a, a lot of growth on them if you can check the trees during the dry season they don't grow the leaves by the dry seasons they suspend all the growth and make sure that all the leaves that are there by these trees are the leaves coming from the previous season so the how the sleep the tree sleeps is called uh, dormancy that is a process which enables the trees to adapt the winter conditions so the trees when they are on deep dormancy nothing is taking place by the branches no growth nothing 
only by the roots is where a lot of things are happening. So you can see that these trees, they, they work in a very amazing way. Eh? They also have time to rest. So now is their, is their resting period. So come spring, you will see everything coming back again. So, but this work differently because some of the trees are deciduous, meaning that they lose their leaves during the dry season. And we even got the evergreen trees. So the evergreen trees, their leaves are so very well designed and covered by a very strong coat, which protects them, which protect them against the cold during the dry season. So I am still now going to head up to a buffer swook dam and see what we are going to find on that side. Let's go and see what we are going to find that side. So here where I am is still very much quiet because uh, we have seen, we have noticed uh, Hosanna. So the presence of Hosanna in the area has got a huge impact on some of the grazers because those animals, they, they know that here there is a predator because now it's not all about Hosanna, it's about Hosanna and also animals can, can smell what is up in that tree. Eh? Maybe when we come back, we might find the hyenas attracted. So I hope there will be some lot of activities taking place when we come back there. So the only species of animals I'm seeing here are the small beds. Not much is happening. So now let's go to Tristan. Uh, he's still searching for his leopard. I am indeed Sydney. So I've just driven through the block following the track as best I could. We lost it in the block, but it's kind of heading back to the direction that she came from. And well, anytime you have a leopard that walks back on its own tracks and kind of goes back after fetching a cub is always a good sign that there might be a kill around. So now what I want to do is just try and go and backtrack Tandy's last tracks and see if I can't figure out where they went from there. I can't pick out where they've come through the block and sort of landed on the next road. It seems as though somebody might have driven over them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do back Atelier Road and we're going to come around onto Mamba and just try and see if I can pick out where she came out of the block initially going towards that direction and then maybe backtrack those tracks and hopefully find her on a kill. That's the kind of plan for the afternoon. Maybe we'll get it right, maybe we won't, but we'll try and see. Herbie says he might come and give us a hand. It depends on how Steve is doing and what he's up to and how his medicinal Monday is going but other than that it's fairly quiet around you I haven't seen too much in this sort of form of antelope it's eerily quiet in this area at the moment Matt, no, Klalamba is not safe from Hukumuri at all. In fact, Hukumuri is a very, very real threat to Tandi and Klalamba at the moment. And it's why we've seen that Tandi sort of a few months ago when Tingana was down and out for a bit and was sort of not marking his territory or making any effort to vocalize or scent mark that Hukumuri started to push in and we used to see Hukumuri sometimes where I am now which is really very far east and that saw Tandis kind of take Klalamba and drag her further to the east and into Torchwood so is she Hukumuri is a massive threat. He's a, he's a very big danger to to Klalamba and even at this age Klalamba is still very small and she'll get killed by him if he comes into contact and can find her. So definitely not good and, and that's why we need Tingana, a very fit Tingana, to be up and about and calling and scent marking and being in the area. Obviously, you know, it's, it's a catch-22 because his active patrolling and calling could potentially force Hosanna to move away and, and 
no longer sits in our area, which would be a bit of a shame because it's thoroughly enjoying the fact that Hosanna is back. But I'm hoping that maybe somehow he's able to charm his dad into kind of staying a little bit longer and we don't have too much of a stress. But we do need Tingana patrolling and that will keep Hukumuri at bay. The other good thing that's happened, which will hopefully also keep Hukumuri further to the west, is that he's now mated with Tiani and Shadulu. Now, if one of those two has cubs, it's going to keep him that side because he's going to be actively patrolling in order to try and defend those cubs and so hopefully that will kind of keep him that in that area and, and you know it will allow Klalamba to get a little bit bigger a little stronger before he kind of comes back into the section or tries to push into the section again so it'll be interesting to see if Tingana can hold out one more year then we should have a good situation and Klalamba should be okay Right, so no tracks for Tandy coming this way, which means that if she went Mamba side, maybe the kill is off that area, that side somewhere. It'll be interesting to see. We're going to try and check and see what we can find. Good. While we do that, let's send you back across to Steve and see what he's up to. And I don't know if he's continuing with his Medicinal Monday teachings, but it sounds like it's all been very interesting so far. We are still brewing everything that we need, and Herbie is assisting. He has uh, harvested some little bits of bark. He's busy making something on the side, which we'll show you shortly. I'm not much of a platter when it comes to that, but the bark is very, very useful as a twine and as a rope. Um, so we'll talk about that. But the tonic that I've made, um, I'm going to pour it just into this little plate so you can kind of see the color. That's the color there. The tonic is out of the root powder, and the powder of the root is also an elixir so by making this tonic the tonic can be used to cure constipation abdominal pain it's also been known apparently to assist in preventing miscarriage and you can either drink this or you can put it into your food or your porridge and you can take it in just into the body through ingestion and the reason we don't boil it is a lot of the nutrients can be lost uh, through boiling so just to to heat it up cool it down get all the active ingredients out very, very important but what you can also do if you're brave enough I suppose is you can also use this as an eye wash if your eyes oh, let me turn that down it's boiling over the decoction is almost ready you can use it as an eye wash to to cure any sort of eye ailments that you might have such as pink eye um, and what you can also do is you can drink this funny enough to cure pneumonia so if you have a problem with a cough, a chest complaint, that can work quite well indeed. So quite a useful part of the plant. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn down, turn that off, and we're going to the big reveal of the decoction. And I'm going to sieve it out, strain it out, which is very, very important because there's lots and lots of good stuff coming in there. Have a look at the color, if you will. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Now, Fergus told me he's not brave enough to drink this, but this is going to be extremely bitter. Extremely bitter. And um, this is a decoction, ladies and gentlemen, of the roots. And now, in the making of a decoction, you basically boil two parts to one part. So two parts water to one part of the ingredient for eight to ten minutes to get those ingredients out. And um, I think I've done very well there. Let me just move that out the way. It's very hot. I'm going to need to cool that down for now. But by drinking that, oopsie, I've just poured it all over my book. By drinking that, you can assist in, in certain intestinal wor uh, worms inside the body. Something that a lot of people aren't aware of is that we do get worms. We do get parasites inside our body. And by drinking a decoction out of these roots, you can eliminate that. It's also very good for treating uh, sort of bilharzia. And bilharzia is something contracted by snails. The schistosoma uh, virus or disease, which comes through snails, it gets into our blood. It affects our liver and our kidneys and actually causes us to get urine in the blood. So you can assist that. So if you do start getting urine in your blood, you might might potentially have bilharzia and a cup of decocted silver cluster leaf might be the trick it is going to be extremely bitter unfortunately it is still very very hot and apparently by drinking this it's also going to assist in nausea and assisting me in not throwing up Corin, you want to know why I'm interested in this sort of medicine I love the wilderness I love what it has to offer um, hopefully I can get some cold water out of my bag there we go, it's working. Um, a lot of this medicine and a lot of this traditional knowledge, Karen, is being lost, unfortunately. Um, a lot of people who, who live in these areas are moving away from them. They're not 
uh, allowing the, the, the knowledge to be passed down. A lot of the knowledge isn't even written down. A lot of it passed down, used to be passed down from generation to generation, and a lot of youngsters are, are not really interested anymore. So we're losing traditional stuff. We're losing history, as it will, and a lot of the medicinal plants we have out in the world, all over the world, all the plants in nature have some value to man, and we are all just forgetting about it. So to me, I find that very interesting. Living off the land is very, very important, and if we can go out and harvest something for ourselves as a tonic, as a cure-all, as something to sort of boost our immune system rather than taking pharmaceutical drugs, well, I'm, I'm A for that. But I'm not recommending that for everybody out there. This is definitely a, a particular kind of thing that I do, and if you're not into it, well, that's perfectly fine. So I'm about to drink some. Are you ready? <laughs> yes. Herbie, come on. Herbie wants some. Do you want some? He doesn't want any. Her Fag, are you sure? It's bitter, but it's it's doable. No one wants to try with me. There we go. It's bitter, but it's very doable. Yeah? Nice, eh? Hey? Okay, so we all know that most, most medicines are supposed to be bitter, and uh, that's just the way it is. If it's not bitter, you know, it's not working. So what also being done is by using these, you see the color there, you know I like to show the color. This can apparently also be sort of used intravaginally to assist in opening of the birth canal during pregnancy and it's possibly that's why certain animals will feed on the plant. Um, we're not obviously going to be doing any of that today and I do not claim myself to be anywhere near qualified to talk about those sort of things. But it's very interesting how all of these things from one plant out in the African wilderness with its very bitter flavor and taste, we see animals eating the pods, uh, we have individuals doing things with the bark and uh, I think Herbie's going to quickly show us. Can you quickly show us one of your your, your, your things you've made? Look at what Herbie's made out of the bark there. Okay, so Herbie has made these beautiful things. Little bracelets for the five ladies in FC. Aren't you ladies beautifully lucky? Look at that. So beautiful twine made by Herbie out here in the wilderness while waiting and doing a medicinal product which is I think is fantastic so you ladies are getting a present this afternoon and one thing before we finish I forgot the powder as well can be sprinkled into a wound and this bark is very very good as sort of a bandage and as twine and you can wrap it on and you can sprinkle it in and it actually works as sort of an anti antibiotic to an injury that you might have sort of a wound cleaner which I think is fantastic so I'm going to continue sipping my tea Not really great. I'm going to go to Sydney, who I'm sure has got a very nice view at the Sook Watering Hole. Yeah, indeed, this is quite a very beautiful uh, sighting. You can see the majestic land mammal is now having a drink. Look at those ears. Beautiful, eh? Oh. Yes, it's just shaped like an African map. So this is very much beautiful. So the elephants, they can be able to drink up to 150 to 200 liters of water a day. But the males, sometimes they lose this kind of water they, they got from the dams because males, they got to go through a certain stage every year which is called must and this stage mostly come to these elephants uh, for about seven consecutive days it can be even more than that so when the elephants are must is when they are not very social so we try by all means to avoid them when they are on must so during summer season mostly elephants after having a drink you will see as a as a head they will go in and play there and you'll see them swimming and pushing each other. Elephants, they do enjoy swimming. Eh? And sometimes they can submerge uh, until you don't see that body and just see the trunk when they are about to breathe. Beautiful, eh? So the males, yes, uh, sometimes they go by themselves. 
So they go far away from the head, but they keep going back to the head again. But when they are there by the head, they know their main responsibility by the head is to discipline the teenagers, the youngsters. When the youngsters are not are getting out of hand, they get called to come closer and then they single few of them out. You will see them taking them through a disciplinary session to try and teach them to have some good manners. So the Yeah, we can go to Tristan. He's got something to show us about the antelopes. Well, I've got a kudu, so it is a different antelope that we have found this afternoon. We've been seeing quite a number of different species. We just had a beautiful grouping of nyala that is also down in the Mulwati system, which was very, very nice, and they were kind of moving about all around the vehicle and then went off into a thicket. And now a few kudu that are lazily feeding this afternoon. It's beautiful light now as well. It's also a very warm welcome to the Tech Splash conference that's joined us this afternoon. Hopefully you'll enjoy your time with us and hopefully we'll hear from all of you. Remember you can ask us questions on hashtag Safari Live. Now what we're doing is we're still trying to find some sort of sign of Tandi on this sort of side. We've come along and we've checked all along the Mulwati. There's no sign of her moving in this direction. I do apologize about the pole. The pole is for our roof. We had a bit of rain, funny enough, it doesn't look like it now with the blue sky, but we had a bit of rain earlier today just before we actually set out on our afternoon drive and so that's why we've got the roof on and the pole, so I do apologize. But you know, we've kind of looked around for Tandi's tracks and, and for any signs of, of her moving here and so far nothing yet. So she must be further sort of to the east. So I'm just going to continue slowly moving east back to where the, the tracks came from on Mamba and see if we can find her and whether or not she does indeed have a kill. So that's the kind of plan going forward. Good. But it's such a beautiful afternoon now. It's still very chilly and the wind is very cold, but that sun coming out, there's some beautiful light that we're getting now just sort of filtering down and it's it's such a nice wintry afternoon in that regard often when you get this cold weather like this it's really really gives you beautiful light the air becomes crisp and clear and you get this kind of soft wintry light which is great good now Sydney is, seems to be having a rollicking afternoon after seeing Hosanna earlier now sitting with some beautiful pachyderms at Bilfelzook Dam Yeah, the, the elephant just now finished drinking. I can see he's uh, moving away from the dam now. So let's see when he comes out to that other side of the tree. I just want to try and check by the back legs because the elephants, when they are on mast, you will see they normally urinate over their hind legs. If the hind legs are very wet, you must keep a distance because that is when they can be very much dangerous. But you can you can pick up the smell as well. It's associated with a very distinctive smell. Uh, Angela, the elephants can be able to eat much as. Uh, 400 kilograms a day they can eat eat a lot eh? but they don't digest everything so from 400 kilograms they will just digest about 45 percent of all the food they have eaten a day so i just want to try and see if we can have a better sighting from this side So when there is a lot of food available, elephants, they don't travel too much. Uh, also, when they've got very small babies, you'll see they will be feeding, feeding very stationary, but they don't travel long distances. Long distances now by the dry season, they are left with no option. They must have to go a lot in search of water because some of the dams, they are non-perennial, so they are very seasonal. So when the dams are, are becoming dry, they must have to now go and see if they can find some of the water very far. So you can see it's now going back to the thick bushes. 
I'm not too sure if maybe he's following a head or he's just by himself. Yeah, he's trying to feed now. So these males, they they can they can weigh up to five thousand kilograms. Eh? The elephants are huge, uh, whereas their females can weigh up to three and a half thousand uh, kilograms. That is about three and a half tons. In other words, the males they can weigh up to five tons. Babies, just shortly after birth, they can weigh up to hundred and twenty kilograms. So you can see. The elephants are very much heavy. Yeah, and now let's go to Steve and see what Steve has got on the other side. I will be now slowly making my way back to uh, Hosanna. Well, thank you, Sydney. We have packed up and we are all ready to go again. I'm going to, have to walk into the direction. Tristan's given us some heads up about some directions of a potential lepidus. So we might go see if we can follow up. I hope you all enjoyed the medicinal stuff. Hope it's not too arduous for you. I find it very interesting talking about these things. There's so much out in the wilderness and out in the world to provide us with all sorts of answers to the humour. Not to the humor, but to, to the human's lifestyle and to where we live. Bradley, you like it? Thank you very much. Um, and w one last thing that can be done with the plant, especially when these are purple. Uh, you can actually make very nice earrings out of them when they're fresh. They pop in. I've broken the stalks off of it, but you pop them in and bloops. They look quite nice. The purple pod cluster leaf, which is the, the sister of this one, you could say, makes even nicer ones. They're much more purple in their colour. Anyway, on we go. Herbie, we're going to head down towards the Umulawati drainage system, which is just down the hill here. Hopefully the elephant herd has moved further north from where they were before. And we go see if we can pick up on any of those tracks that Tristan is talking about. Potentially Tundi has kind of come back in this direction. And by the movement... She's gone back and fetched what he thinks would be Tlalamba and then come back again. And to us, that normally, normally means that the leopard has found or has killed something and has something to bring her food back to. Watch out for the thorns there, Ferg. Never too late. I've never seen a black leopard. I, I don't know if you get them in, in southern southern Africa. I know where the topic did come up at one stage and, and Brent said he'd seen one. Of course he had. I'm not sure where though, for somewhere in Africa, but I really don't know enough about it to give you that answer. So you'll be sorry. On we go. James, you've... Leidenberg. Okay, black leopard in Leidenberg. That's very interesting. Leidenberg's not far away. Just sort of that direction, maybe two and a half hours, three, three hours. That's very interesting. Leidenberg's all the way on the way back up to Johannesburg. It's kind of like about a third of the way to Joburg from here. And um, it's quite a built-up area, well, agriculturally-wise. And for there to be a black leopard or something like that, that's very interesting. I need to do some, some reading about that. Very, very cool. Very cool. Lovely afternoon. The clouds are clearing. I guarantee you that whatever heat is generated today is going to dissipate very quickly this afternoon. We're going to be in for a very, very cold evening. Well, Sydney is um, moving probably faster than we are. He's driving. Yeah, and I'm now heading back to see if there is some other activities down there where I left Hosanna uh, earlier on. But now what I'm going to do is to reverse and show you one of the very interesting plants. I've just noticed it now while I was going that side. So now let me check here. Let me just confirm first if this is the right plant. Eh? Yeah, I just want to check if this is the the right plant. Oh yes. Now it is the, the, the right plant. Eh? 
So now I want to show you something here. When I was still very young. When I grew up, I was taught to do the photo. No, youngsters, uh, this is uh, what we do. If you do something at home, let's say if you are involved on any of the wrongdoing in the morning and the parents are not there, this is what you do. For them to forget to ask you, we come to this tree. This is called a sickle bush. We come to whereby they, the branch are splitting like this and then we split them. You will see they, they can break a little bit going down. And this is what we do. We come to the plant and we pour the saliva there and close it. And when closing, I must have to give the tree a message to say, please, I have done some something wrong at home and I want my parents to forget about it. They mustn't ask me when I get home. So if you go to that side of Venda, you will see a lot of these sickly bushes. They are splitted, splitted because the youngsters, when they are involved in wrongdoing, they must have to come and talk to the tree in order to uh, in order to make their parents to forget about the wrongdoing when they come back home before the sunset. Before the sun sunset, yes. Okay, that was the story I wanted to share with you. Let's carry on and see what we're going to find. Yeah, let's see what we're going to find going down. Uh, Kent, I didn't copy the question very nicely. I just got the last part, which was about the hibernation. If I can just get... Uh, Ken, yes, the snakes, they are left with no option but to hibernate during the winter season. So it's quite very difficult at this stage to come across the snakes. Yes, I saw, I saw that this morning or yesterday, some of my colleagues came across some of the snake tracks by this time of the year, which is something very, very rare. Snakes, by this time of the year, they hibernate. Let's just uh, go to the area where we have left Hosanna this morning. Yeah. And where we left Hosanna earlier or not this morning, sorry. Yeah, let's now go to Steve. He's got something to talk about a plant. Well, indeed we are in the middle of winter as you folks know and as we walk through the wilderness you notice that most of the trees are leafless most of them anyway and here we are pretty much on the stop on the top of the slope here and uh, we have got some trees and this one right here is called the apple leaf and it is very green and the apple leaf is actually a very good indicator of moisture and the leaf structure is one of what we'd call a compound leaf. There's more than one leaflet and beautiful big green leaves. And the reason they are really large is because they are big pumps for sucking water from deep down in the ground. And the apple leaf generally is always green. I've never seen one without leaves because they don't grow where there's no water. So and this is the sound. Have a listen. Did that sound like a scrunchy green apple? That's apparently where the name came from. But I believe that the, the dry leaves actually sound more like it. Are you ready? It sounded like an apple, didn't it? Yeah. Very, very green and uh, not really eaten. They're not really touched, as you can see. I mean, look at the height of this plant. It's perfectly in reach of pretty much most of the browsing animals that you find around. But if you come in here and have a look, it's not really fed upon. It's quite tough. Uh, the leaves are quite what we call sclerophyllous in a way, which means they're leathery and tough, and they're not really designed to fall off too much. But they produce an enormous amount of photosynthesis for the plant, 
and the apple leaf pumping up lots and lots of moisture is a very good indicator of where you could actually dig for a borehole or a pump system. And just across the way, not far from where we are, is a termite mound. So not necessarily is there actually water up here, but possibly this apple leaf has accessed a channel that the termite mound has got because we know that these termites, the large fungus growing termites, have access to the water table. They need it for the humidity that it provides and they need it for the wet soil as well that they bring up to the surface to build the mound. And often you find plants even high up on this on the slopes that can be green because they're accessing water through these guys. So once again, just like in the beginning of the drive, how important the termites are for the ecosystem, certain trees love them as well. Minamu, I've never even heard of a dragon blood tree. That sounds very interesting. Have you heard of one, Ferg? Mm -mm. I've never heard of one. I would love to find one. That sounds like it would be very... Sounds Lord of the Rings-like. Rings yeah, indeed. Okay, well, we're going to continue on. Uh, we've been in touch with Tristan, and we, we started to consider the time, and he actually might be quite far that way. But we're going to do a little bit of a loop, see how we get and uh, then we might slowly start making our way back before the sun sets in the west because as you know here in the winter it disappears very very quickly and that's when the leopards come out and it seems like Sydney is almost back to the chief. Yeah, I, I am now slowly uh, going back to see if I'm going to find something happening by Hosanna and uh, but as I'm going there, I will also be looking for some other interesting animal. It's just that after the elephant, I have not yet come across any other interesting animals except bears. And these bears, they are all just flying away from me. Eh? Uh, I didn't get the question very well. If you can repeat here a little bit. Yes, uh, Kimberly, uh, I am now in the middle of the wild and where I am is quite very much thick. It's quite difficult to tell the distance uh, between me and the animal activities. But you know, in the wild, this is very normal. Eh? I cannot say I am very far away from the animals at this stage because I cannot see clearly what is behind these bushes. But the distance between me and Wasana, I am just about a few kilometers away. I am heading back there now. What I can I didn't get the name of the viewer, but um, what I can tell you is that yes, I'm not too sure if they can see seven times. I just picked up uh, Mama. Uh, from the name of the viewer uh, my apologies i cannot hear very well the full name and what i wanted to say is that the the, the leopards and the cats yes some of the people they're saying they can see up to seven times better than we do i'm not too sure if uh, that is real but yes what i can tell you is that the cats can be able to see very very well also at night Yeah, I was trying to check if I'm going to pick up something here, but I can see it's, uh, it's very difficult to see any of this animal there in this uh, kind of bushes. Oh, yes. Now I think I have got something. I think I've got something. 
I think I've got something to show you here. So I think I've got something for you there. Eh? So you can see that it's very much difficult to tell. You can see that it's very much difficult to tell the distance between me and the animals until I see them. It's not like there is no animals here where I'm driving. So animals can be there and hide easy, very easy for me to pass them because they are so very well designed and they can come off legs very easily. So now I have got one of those very interesting and beautiful to me the impulses are very beautiful hey eh? so animals such as the leopards they prey the impalas a lot because it's lightweight they can just do anything with an impala they can easily take it up to a tree eh? so it's a head of impala there's quite a lot of them there and i can see this even uh, some young males so now uh, let's let's go to Steve Steve has got something to talk about the grass well we are stopping to watch the Sun we can feel that as the Sun is sinking into the horizon the temperature is indeed dropping so no doubt it's going to be beanies and gloves on this evening hey Ferg <laughs> Yes, indeed. Beautiful afternoon. And I've just stopped here in a little bit of an open patch. Once Ferg has stopped being all artistic, he'll come and join me. Cameramen like their, their sunset shots with leaves and grasses. It is really quite picturesque. And it is what makes the show. You know, we can talk about as much stuff as we want to, but if it wasn't for these geniuses on their cameras, well, what would the show really be? being able to capture all of this into a lens and sending it all the way across the world to wherever you might be really is part and parcel at all so here I've got a little bit of a sort of a disturbance area that has occurred due to to possibly elephants busy feeding and digging and scratching and doing their thing and um, the sort of the dead or the remains of some round leaf teaks over here they were much bigger. If you come in a bit closer, Ferg, you might be able to see. And you see this stump here. Quite incredible. This stump was actually the tree. And it's not just one. There's about four or five of them here. This is the stump. And all that's left is the coppice growth. So I think possibly elephants got involved at some point. There might also have been an occurrence of fire at some point. But the trees are still living, still doing their thing. And... Um, whole change in the ecosystem. I can't imagine how big these would have been. We don't see round leaf teaks of that size. We only see these small ones, these small little shrubs growing out because um, the elephants really, really do enjoy them. I've never seen one taller than my head. Maybe, maybe a little bit taller than my head, but nothing thicker than, than sort of a couple inches round like that. But what I stopped initially for was this beautiful little plant growing in the depression here caused by all of this disturbance and damage and it is a tree that we also don't get too many big ones and there's two little babies there that are baby little zebra woods that are busy growing just in here the the sort of shade provided by these little plants which isn't too much at the moment but the disturbance of the ground this very open area that's been all sorts of activity and and elephants and who knows what else has created the damage these two little guys here, will they grow up to become adults? Will they be browsed? Will they be destroyed? Who knows what will happen to them? We can only watch and observe. You know, Steph was talking about on his bushwalk about how the occurrence of drought as well as fire has limited the amount of, of large zebra woods that you find in and around. And these two are tiny. There's no grass material around them, so to speak, so the chances of fire affecting these two is very slim. But that herd of impala you saw moments ago with Sydney, if they walk through here, very easily munch off all of these leaves, and there we go, they will be done. But it's so interesting to see such a small little tree still with green leaves at this time of year. They must have an enormous root system. Well, we're going to carry on. Uh, we're moving 
up the slope now, and let's go to Tristan. I believe he's still on the tracks of Tandy. We are indeed, so we're just backtracking her, which sounds very counterintuitive in many respects because you're kind of following the opposite direction to where she headed. But, like I say, if she went and fetched Klalamba and headed back in a similar direction, it could very well be that she has food. And so, what I'm doing is I've managed to track her back to pretty much where we are now. So, now I'm just trying to kind of double check and see if I can find where she went because I have a sneaky suspicion that she might have a kill somewhere and now it's just about trying to find exactly where it is but these game pods are delightful at the moment because she's using or most of our leopards are using them and they're leaving very clear evidence that they've been there which is quite nice the only problem is is that everything else is using them too and so it's making it incredibly kind of hard it's like this rock hard layer that's been baked by the sun through the winter months and that makes it a little bit tougher to actually pick up her tracks on that she's a very small female obviously and quite light and so she doesn't leave a heavy sort of track like a lion would she's got a very dainty little footprint now interestingly enough I can't see any tracks on this section which means that she must have come from more there because the last track I had was coming from a little mud wallow and kind of joining this track and I thought it would come back onto the track because this sort of pathway that we've got coming down in front of me it splits into sort of three around these mud wallows so I thought she might come back from this side and round but she might have actually come from a little bit further to my west in which case there's quite a few nice marula trees on my western side as David's going to show you shortly is a beautiful golden sunlight too that's coming from that side but maybe she's got something stashed in that area over there the tracks for her and Plalamba come straight in this direction obviously I didn't see them crossing Drakensberg but where were they were on Cheetah Cut Line we are directly in line now if they had to just walk a straight line they would walk pretty much where we are now so I wonder if maybe somewhere here there isn't a carcass that she's got that the two of them are feeding on the problem is, is if she doesn't have it in the tree it's gonna be very difficult to find it on a vehicle we'll have to employ the help of Steve and Herbie for this one so let's just see I just want to double check quickly at the junction here of this pathway to see if they cross the road Amanda, yes, I mean the sun is not good for anybody's eyes to look at it directly and so you'll find that the animals very seldom look directly at the sun. They try and avoid looking at it as much as possible um, and that's why predators are very sneaky and very clever and that they will often sort of use the sun in order to gain an advantage to be able to basically not blind the antelope but make it very difficult for the antelope to actually see them coming so you'll find very often predators will have the sun at their back if they can help it if the wind is in the right direction and then they they will walk with the sun directly behind them so that the antelope have to kind of stare into the sun and they blink a lot and it's not very pleasant at all and so you'll find then it helps the predators in their hunting so sun is never great for any animal's eyes you'll never find even our cats staring directly at the sun they'll kind of avert their gaze much like us if you staring directly into the sun you'll kind of drop your eyes a little bit toward towards the sort of horizon and into the, 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 the foreground rather than actually right at the sun itself so you know it's never good to be looking into the sun for anything really it's far too powerful for all of our eyes to be honest oh Tandy come on be up in one of these trees all we need is just for her to be up or Tlalamba to be up or even a dangling carcass and then we can spot it from quite far that's the nice thing about winter is that there's no leaves on the trees and it makes life a lot easier in terms of being able to spot things so I'm just driving very slowly because I'm trying to scan all of these big trees in the hope that maybe something is up inside them it's gonna be difficult though I don't know if we're gonna get this right without being on foot a little bit more and it's getting to that stage of the day where it's gonna be a bit dark to actually follow tracks fairly shortly so I just have to see I didn't find any tracks of Klalamba though coming back with Tani on that pathway so I might be completely wrong it's just a hunch that I have and you know it's sometimes good to investigate hunches and try and work it out it's a plausible idea that's for sure because she definitely went and fetched the little one and came back in a similar direction so normally when that happens and I discussed it with Herbie on the radio briefly and he reckons I'm right as well that there might be a kill nearby no there's a little stem book it's amazing how well these things camouflage 
There it is. It's only because the light is on it that we saw it so easily. A little female. You can see a lack of... Is there no horns there? Or are there horns? No, no horns. It's a little female that's in the beautiful afternoon sunlight. Isn't that pretty? They're so often overlooked. We, you know, we tend to drive around and we often are focused on cats and, you know, big animals like the ellies. But these little guys, or well, most of our antelope actually, are very beautiful animals. And sometimes it's worth just stopping and having a little look. And we've had a really successful antelope drive, haven't we, David? Oh, yeah. Yes, we've seen Stienbok, we've seen Daco, we've seen Yala, Kudu, um, Impalas. That's not bad for this for a sort of wintry afternoon. That's very blustery. So I'm quite chuffed with our sort of our haul of antelopes for the afternoon. Now, I believe Steve has a feathered friend, so before it flies away, let's quickly jump across to him. Yes, well, we've got more than one, Tristan. There's an entire cacophony of things going on here. Aramark babblers, forktail drongos, grey go-away bird. It's either an owl that they've spotted, or it's a snake. This is apparently World Snake Day, so well done to the snakes. Happy Snake Day to you. And uh, if it is a snake moving around, it's moving very quickly because the birds are here and they moved over there. So it's more likely chances that it is an owl. But these kind of alarm calls, you probably can't hear them. Very difficult to hear them. But these accumulations of birds making all these rackets of noises are definitely cat, serval even. Owls and then snakes. Slender mongoose also gets a little bit of a shout from time to time. And they basically do that because a lot of these predators are stealthy and camouflaged. And you think it's quite sort of strange. Why come out and show yourself to a predator? But the predator's objective is to be stealthy and camouflaged and to get close without being detected. And by shouting at them with all your friends, you're basically telling the animal it's been seen and then it, it moves off. We often see that with, with Kudu and Impala and Yala will even follow the leopard as it moves off into the bushes and they'll follow it until they can't see it anymore. Uh, and then eventually they'll run away. But up until that point, they'll just shout their fury, which is what we're hearing over here. Hello, James. The largest distribution for snake species out. Just straight away, I'd think puff adder, but um, that would be my first guess, puff adder. Very common snake all over South Africa, so that would be my first guess. But then I'd have to look at a, at a book to really get a proper sort of grasp on it. You do get mumbas, black mumbas, in a lot of places, but I don't think they're everywhere. And you don't get mumbas really. Ugh, you don't get... Um, Puff adders, I think you do get them in the forest as well. It's difficult. Very good question. I don't think, I suppose you'd know, Ferg. wonder if any of you viewers out there has got a, a better answer than I do for which snake species has got the largest distribution. In South Africa, I think, was the question, James. So throughout the country, you know, we don't get, um, we don't get cobra species, the same cobra species all over, like the Cape Cobra, we don't find here, we find it further down in the Cape area, obviously, as the name implies, but up here you do get the spitting cobra, the Mozambican spitting cobra, so there's sort of like an overlap between how they operate. The Boerum slung is, com is, is, is sort of confined to sort of more treed areas, there's very arboreal sort of snakes, so you won't find them in grasslands that I know of, and all of those sort of tree Arboreal snakes as well would be limited to that. The green mamba has got a very small distribution, very sort of tropical forests, but in the rock python could be another one. They're quite widespread. So I would probably assume it's between the puff adder and the rock python. That's my guess anyway, James. I hope that gives you some sort of clarification on what you asked for. Google agrees with me. Rock python. Rock python or um, puff adder. Did you say it agrees with me on the rock python, Megan, or on both? Okay, so it is the rock python, the southern African rock python, um, which is also the, the largest snake we find in the area. Well, an animal that I'm pretty sure would have a very hard time dealing with, Sydney's found Hosanna. Yeah, it was uh, very interesting stories about the animals that has been so very tough to him, 
Now I am here back to Osana. Uh, Osana is still very much relaxed. There has been just a little bit of movement. I can see that where Osana is now is not where I left him. So um, I left him further down a little bit. So he just moved for a short couple of meters. It's even less than 10 meters. Maybe it's about three, four meters. So, but now I can feel that the temperature is changing. So. Uh, I heard, I think it's Paul Cat Mama. Uh, I got the question, the leopards, mostly when hunting, they, they they use the eyesight. Think about the arrangement of the eyes. They, they've got a binocular vision. So it means when they are hunting, they use the eyesight. Yes, they can also pick up the smell of their prey. They can be guided by both smell of the prey and then use the eyesight to target the prey. So when animals are walking around for hunting purposes, they don't only concentrate on the eyesight. Yes, they will be targeting makers of the eyesight, but they can get information from the wind as well about the presence of the prey in the area. So you can see he's still very much relaxed, but uh, I hope he's going to uh, get up and do something here. Maybe go up to the tree there where he left a little bit of remains or uh, go and, and, and see what is happening in the area because not very far away from where this uh, Hosanna is, there is some impalas here. It's just that I lost a visual on them. So maybe if he picks up their presence, he might just try to investigate. But I don't think he's going to hunt now. The bellies to me look very full. So the chances of, of hunting are not there. They are zero at the moment. So you can see the lepers, they always don't have a lot of competitions, eh? Because if they, they catch something, it's up by the tree, no other lepers are here around, he's just by himself. So, but sometimes some of the birds, they can be able to see the carcass up by the trees. Vultures can also get uh, some little bit of shares. They can land by the trees and eat from there. I have seen that happening. I have seen the vultures scavenging the uh, the animals remains up by the trees. Yes, uh, there, there's been a comment which came in now. It's just that I did not manage to get hold of the comment A, a comment from Lara about the size of the tail. Yes, the tail for the leopards are very much long. Eh? You can see there. So if you look at the tip of that tree, that tail, the way it's designed, it is very fluffy at the end. And they use that small part of the tail when they are hunting. You will see them moving these tails, tails, tails. Uh, sometimes when wanting to annoy the prey, they just lift it up so that the prey can see and run away. Sometimes animals, they hunt for fun. So they, when having the, uh, the, the babies, So let's now go to uh, Tristan. He is driving and see what he's got on the other side. Well, I'm not surprised that Hosanna is such a sleepy cat at the moment because 
Well, he was rather active last night, wasn't he? He had all kinds of things going on. And it's amazing that those three Evoca boys just did not pick him up at all and sniff out that carcass and try and steal it from him. I'm quite surprised by that. But stroke of luck for Hosanna. And it's going to be interesting to see how long he stays at the dam because we know at some point a male leopard is going to come past there. Whether it's Hukumuri or Tingana, one of the two of them, at some point is going to be doing their territorial patrols and they're going to end up at the camp itself and they're going to be calling and I wonder what his response is going to be to that. For now though, if nobody comes there, I think he's pretty happy to just stick it out in that area. He's got a perfect place to be hunting and we saw last night how well he executes that hunt using that little verge where the water is and all the animals that have to come down and drink and that are kind of desperate for water in the winter conditions and he can then just kind of pick them off one by one from there so it's typical Hosanna strategy he's, he seems to have kind of worked this out that if he sits by water points and he just waits and he's patient that's where he's going to get all his food and we saw it when he was at Chitra he used to hang around at the dam there and used to pick off little things from the dam itself and then he went you know down towards Londolozi and he used the river where he used to hide in the reeds and as the you know the antelope would come down to drink so he would strike out of those reeds so he's worked out that that's a good strategy and especially at this time of the year animals are all drawn to water points that are you know small water points and it makes it much easier for him to hunt so I think he's gonna surround in this sort of little area until such time as he hears another leopard calling and luckily for him Tingana seems to have gone on a big territorial patrol and has gone all the way into Torchwood and probably down towards Chitwa although he wasn't he hasn't been found in Chitwa yet so I don't think he's made it into Chitwa just yet and so we'll see how that goes maybe he's still gonna be a few days before he comes back and that'll allow Hosanna to have a very good time of it at Gauri Dam I would imagine I wonder where he's going to go from there as well. Is he going to do his usual little wonder to Treehouse Dam and to Twin Dams and just go and check out all his old haunts and see how everything is going? Or do you think, I don't know, what do you guys think? Where do you think he's going to go to next from Gauri Dam? I think he's going to go to Treehouse or Twin Dams. That's what my gut feel tells me. But you never know. Obviously, his, his movements have changed a lot since this time last year. Also, I need to give myself a little slap on the wrist because I've been, I, I was very naughty and I forgot poor Kuchava in our sort of rundown of the Karula lineage, which is very naughty. I was kind of thinking about it and then it just kind of light bulb went off that Tandi has been a shining light and has had two females, not just Falamba, she's also had Kuchava, so that's also carrying the baton for the lineage of Karula and Safari and kind of carrying that forward, so that's very good news and I completely forgot, so I'm, I must apologize, I do apologize about that, sorry Kuchava, hopefully you know, we'll have a situation where she will forgive me and not disappear out of our area and not make me have to work too hard to find her. Right, now I'm still just driving around hoping that I can pick up something, an alarm call or something like that. It's getting too dark now for tracking, so we're going to have to rely on those sensors. And so while we try and do that, let's send you back across to Steve, who's doing the typical pose atop a termite mound. Thanks, Tristan. I'm just practicing my golf swing while I'm up here. Really nice area to just hit a few balls around. Ferg and I have discussed that maybe when we're bored one day we might do that. But indeed I am on top of a termite mound. And uh, termite mounds with little holes inside are perfect places for snakes such as the rock python to try and keep themselves warm and move inside and lay their eggs. They're the only snake that we, that I know of, that actually spends time looking after their youngsters after birth. Which is quite a cool thing to do. Um, and then... And they come out quite, they're born live, they come out and then sh sh off they go, doing their thing. Really, really cool. I absolutely love pythons. I don't really want to ever play with them, but a termite mound like this would be a good spot to look. Um, I don't see any holes in the ground at the moment. The termites seem to have shut everything off. It's all closed. Yeah, well... As I was talking about before, about termite mounds and access to water, here we have got a tree on top of the termite mound that actually shouldn't have any leaves up here but because of the water it does and we come down another step and we've got a jackalberry also leaves this is an absolutely water loving plant another one another jackalberry a small apple leaf growing over here oh that's not an apple leaf no it is there's a small apple leaf growing there another jackalberry it's a very good indication of water and we are right on top of the slope I look around, I've got a full view of the environment. 
everywhere. So very, very important for the for the area like being up here. So proud cat mama, you wanted to know about aggressive snakes. No, I don't really like the word aggressive. If you are a snake and here is your head, you've got this long body which is unprotected. You're very vulnerable to absolutely everything. So snakes come across as being very aggressive, but they're just they're just um, misunderstood, I suppose. If we leave them alone, they leave us alone. I've had many snake encounters in my life where the snake's never done anything to me. It just moves off. If I move up towards a snake, it moves away. They do that. That's what they want to do. They want to escape. They want to evade us. The reason why we get snakes in our houses is because of rodents, because of human cleanliness, just a cokey Franklin shouting in the background. So human cleanliness and hygiene attracts rodents, and we get snakes moving in naturally to, to catch these guys. And so you get snakes in your buildings, and you can quite easily catch them by putting down a long tube. You put it into the corner of the room. You just tap the ground with a stick, and, and the snake goes inside. They don't want to bite us. They don't want to attack us. It costs them energy to bite and to give venom. They don't want to. They're not looking for anything. And there are a lot of animals that really give them a hard time. Dwarf mongooses and mongooses that will live in a termite mound like this will hunt and actively kill snakes. So they're just misunderstood, and they've got a very long body with just a face here to protect themselves. So you would also be a little bit sort of jumpy, wouldn't you? And they respond to movement. So if you see a snake and you just stay still, they don't see you as anything. They might even go across your foot. I've had one go over my leg before without any harm. If I jumped and kicked it, well, he might have bitten me, but purely because he's defending himself. But notoriously, the black mamba is given a bad name and said to be aggressive. But I don't think they're aggressive. I've seen many in my life that just, they move away. It's all about movement. If you see a snake and you, you move like I am now, it's going to think there's something happening and it's going to respond to that movement. So they're not necessarily being aggressive. So I think that's where a lot of people are misunderstood. We freak out, we make a noise, we jump up and down and we see a snake. And what's the snake's first reaction? It's to stand up like this if it's a pi uh, cobra and look at you and want to... What's the movement? What's the movement? Is this going to affect me in any way? So that is it. I hope that answers your question, Proud Cat Mama. We are slowly making our way back as the sun sets in the west. It's getting cold and it's getting a little bit dark. And Tristan, it's lined up the sunset perfectly for you. I have indeed. It's an absolutely spectacular sunset this evening. It's one of those cold winter sunsets where there's a bit of cloud and beautiful, beautiful colours that are kind of forming as the sun is going down. So we've got this beautiful big marula tree that is coming up off the, the ground and then in the backdrop is just a lot of nice yellow and sort of pink clouds and it's only going to get better as that sun drops a little lower so these clouds are just going to get more and more and more color on them as it happens it's just a very pretty scene and it's one of the nice things about being on the the eastern side of Juma is that you've got this ridge that looks over and you kind of look down towards the Muwati and then up onto the other ridge and you get these beautiful kind of backdrops in the afternoon it's a great place to watch the sunset and it's why there's a few drink stops on this road for the various guests that come to the various lodges that traverse Juma and they often are stopped kind of gazing upon these beautiful sunsets pretty though that we have the roof on because the roof is spoiling it a little bit because we can't get a very wide sort of view of the sun at all the other nice thing about stopping and actually just watching the sun setting and looking at the beautiful colors is that it's a good opportunity just to listen for any alarm calls now is the time of the day where i would imagine any of our sort of predators are starting to get going so whether it be hyena or lions or leopard this is the time of the day where they start thinking about moving and so it's important for us to sometimes just turn off just listen and, and try and hear and see if maybe just maybe we can pick up some sort of sign of a predator we've had no more luck with tandy and Columbus tracks i surmise that they are on a kill somewhere i just ran out of time a little bit in terms of being able to find them and so we'll try again tomorrow morning we'll try and see if Thelma can help us early tomorrow morning and then sort of hopefully there'll be a bit of action from there it's going to be interesting to see also what I heard on the radio is that quarantine was seen that going east towards Kruger boundary which is quite nice and then the t Torchwood lionesses that we were seen yesterday with Sydney 
are kind of moving west towards Cheetah Cutline area, or the tracks were anyway. So hopefully they'll make an appearance as well. That's why it's a good time or good place to be where we are now for the remainder of the afternoon. Now Bogart winter is a great time of year for sunsets and well just beauty in terms of the bush. It's a situation where you get a lot of kind of colour and because of the stark contrasts of of and the lack of vegetation, you often get this really beautiful light. In summer, sometimes the light is blocked a little bit, um, blocked by the sunshine, and you get a situation where you know it gets quite sort of very harsh shadows um, in, in, in the summer months whereas in winter you get a much softer light the dust in the air also just creates that sort of soft winter feel this is really very interesting and then you get the starkness of the, the trees as a sort of foreground it's pretty cool so winter is a nice time it's not my favorite time to be honest I'm not I'm a bit winter phobic and the reason why is because I have to wear these and I have to wear jackets and it's just all too much really for me I don't really like it and I hate the fact that you have a runny nose all the time and you kind of have to sit in the cold it's very very miserable I'm a much bigger fan of summer I like hot temperatures and the rain and all of that that bring what well, the rain brings about so not a huge fan of winter but for game viewing purposes it's always nice and for tracking purposes it's the best because you get these soft substrates that make tracking super easy so that's a nice sort of side of winter that's the only reason I can get through winter is because I can actually track a lot and, and find animals a little bit easier but otherwise I don't know if I would be able to deal with winter I might have to be a summer chaser as I get older what are they called again snowbirds snowbirds is the word <laughs> David how do you feel about winter and summer what's your what's your season you're a summer boy as well, yes, David. I thought so. I thought you would say that. Good. Well, let's um, send you across to Sydney and find out what season he likes. And I, I have a funny feeling that Hosanna is a winter boy just because he likes to hunt. But I don't know. You guys can make up your mind as to what you think he is. Yeah, my uh, preference when it comes to the season, I prefer the winter season because the winter season, I can easily uh, control it. When it comes to the summer season, it's very hot and it's uncontrollable. It's not like now whereby when it's cold, I can wear this jersey. When it's too much cold, I can duplicate the jerseys. I am still here, you can see um, Osana is still very much relaxed, although we have just recently had some visitors. We had about three um, to four elephants, they passed by. Osana was up trying to look at what is happening because uh, he was very surprised. The elephants were just breaking trees passing by. Then he woke up a little bit and checked. I think it was about eight, nine minutes and then again Osana decided to carry on sleeping, which is not a problem because I will wait and see. I think now the temperatures and everything is getting there. Everything is dropping now after the sunset. And that is when the cats such as this, they wake up and go back to eat their remains. Some is when now they are getting very active to go around. Maybe something is going to come here, not knowing that uh, Hosanna is, uh, is is very relaxed behind the, in between these trees. So you can see, look at that, uh, the, 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 the paw for that front. You can see it clearly. Eh? So if you look at those uh, toes there, you can see that the the nails are not there but he does have some nails he can bring them out when he wants to use them and then he can hide them so what you are seeing there now is what we normally see on the ground so you can see it's clear you can even see the the lobes there you can see the three lobes from that front one that's quite a very nice track, eh? Nice and round. And I know some of the people, they get confused between the leopard tracks and the cheetah tracks. So if you look there, these ones for the leopards are more round, the toes, eh? And you cannot see the, the, the nails. The cheetah ones, you'll see the nails.
Yeah, now let's go to Steve on his way home and see what he's going to find. Yes, well, one last thing. We just heard a bearded woodpecker flying into the tree. There you might be able to see him. He's busy pecking very viciously against that marula, looking for any kind of insect, boring insect, beetle larvae that might be inside, using his very strong beak and insulated, comforted head. And I feel like my head is not very comfortable at the moment because I made, I believe, a glaring error moments ago. I think I might have said in my last discussion that pythons give birth to live young, which is completely false. I must have been getting confused with the um, puff adder. That is, puff adders give birth to live young. Quite scary, that is, all these baby snakes popping out of a larger snake. And what I did find is I found some eggs here in the grass and I thought I'd um, at least give you one little treat of, of fun this afternoon. I just pulled the tailor on you because uh, Taylor did this to everybody a while ago. And everyone honestly thought it was Cory Busted Eggs, but it's actually hyena dung. So what would a bushwalk segment be without some poo? And there is some poo for all of you back there. The very white, capsulated caps of hyena dung. And I do apologize for any snake error I might have made. I think my brain is getting a little bit cold. Well, we are on our way home. It is getting chilly as the wind is increasing for some reason. It dropped for a moment. The clouds are disappearing, but it is going to be a beautiful, cool night. And we are going to be going to bed. Well, not to bed, but home soon. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the game drive safari with the other two gentlemen. And on that note, let's go back over to the little chief. Yeah, Hosanna is still not doing anything at the moment, but I, I, I hope he's going to come up and do something. Eh? I am hoping to see Hosanna climbing that tree again, going up to that uh, remains. That is going to be very much interesting. Eh? Yes, uh, I did get the question. For, I didn't get the question nicely from Raj, uh, but it's to do with the age of uh, the leopard doing something. If you can just uh, repeat that question again, FC. I st I'm still battling to get that question. Maybe it's my. Earpiece, if you can just again repeat that for me. So you can see now at least there is some little bit of movement. Maybe it's going to wake up. Eh? can see there he's moving the whiskers a little bit. Uh, Angela, they, they, the lepers, they can take some of the big animals, eh, but they don't take it when it's big. Remember, some of these animals, for example, I'm going to use the kudu on this one. You find that these animals are very big antelopes, but they've got to go through different stages. So the lepers mostly, they target the animals at young stage. So they can take some of the big, big, big antelopes, but they don't take them when they're big. They take them when they're still going through different stages. So they, they, they target mostly the light, light animals because they know the advantage of targeting the lightweight animals is to drag the carcass up to a tree. But if something is way much big, he knows very well that he's, he has done the job alone, he hunted that prey alone, he took the prey alone. Killing an animal is very much tiring for just a one leopard. So otherwise, he is going to lose the whole carcass. The carcass will be taken by other scavengers so that is why they always avoid the big antelopes 
It's not like they don't have an ability to take down the big animals. They can. They can try and do that. But the problem is the energy lost during the hunting and chasing, they're not going to get it back because it will be too big for them to drag it up to a tree. Yeah, so now uh, let's go to uh, Tristan. He's got uh, some beds to show us on the other side. I do have a bird to show you, a bit of colour on a rather miserable winter day, to be honest. I suppose we had a nice sunset, but a crested bob, it certainly adds a splash of colour to the otherwise dry and drab winter felt that we have in South Africa at the moment, and so always nice to see these birds. Unfortunately, it's bounced its way rather far away at the moment. It's kind of... It was close right in front of us on the road and now it's just decided it's going to go look for food all over the place and is being really active about its search and well there we go it's now flown away at least we got to see it because birds normally do this to you they sit in front of the camera until such time as as you guys join us then they fly away it happens all the time and it is quite irritating to be honest good well uh, now that our bird has flown away we still haven't heard any alarm calls i've spent quite a lot of time just sitting and kind of listening from drakensberg area just to try and maybe pick up something but really there's not much going on in terms of alarms or sounds in general and so what I think I'm going to do is that I'm pretty sure that Tandi and Plalamba are going to kill inside this block. It's too dark now to actually go and really search properly other than in the hope that they pop up into a tree while I'm driving now and get silhouetted against the sunlight and we spot them. But I think I'm going to slowly meander my way now in a westerly direction towards Tundams and then via Janet Jackson's house to see if Janet Jackson is home and then around to Treehouse and the only reason I want to go to Treehouse is in the off chance and I say this in the massive off chance that maybe just maybe Tumba has somehow sneaked across onto our side and might be in that area so that's the kind of plan I'm gonna go and just check it out and see you can see where Tundi walked along this is where she came from up Mamba Road so we we'll just try and see if maybe we can get lucky with a little Tumba I know the last time he was seen was on the western sector and so maybe he's gonna move east and come this side he has this habit of following Hosanna around and so maybe we'll get a situation where with Osana arriving, Tumba will be the next one to make an appearance. Also, I haven't spent any time really in the west. I've been so much in the east because of Tingana and Tandi and Klalamba that I've hardly driven the western side of, of Juma over the course of the last few days. And so it will be nice just for a bit of a change of scenery to see what's happening on that side. There's always the chance of Shadulu or Pukamuri and always that's always a kind of good thing to try and go and look for so I'm not too stressed about heading in that direction it would have been nice to have found Tandi and Flalamba in time but like I say tomorrow morning we'll employ the services of Thelma and see how things go maybe we can find the two of them perched in a tree somewhere with a kill you know me I, um, I suppose uh, I'm not really sure actually to be honest. I know you know leopards use canines pretty effectively in, in trying to kill prey animals. I suppose they could they could survive without them. I mean there's obviously a lot of leopards and lions that have lost canines and have a situation where they've only got you know three or two even sometimes and they still manage. I, I think it would be a lot more difficult. They wouldn't really be able to get that choke hold that they get sometimes. They would, might be able to do the nose where they get the, the nose and the face and then they just clamp down and close all of that up so that, that animal can't breathe. That might be possible but I don't think that they would have the ability to be able to actually sever the carotid or do the choke hold across the neck and that might make things a little tougher um, but I think they'd still be able to survive you know they might just resort to hunting smaller things so going after things like scrub hares or um, even small animals like a daker where they can get on the back here and just the force of their bites would be enough to sort of break the spine and, and kill the animal that way or in a situation where they go after snakes um, birds lizards um, those kind of things they might go start trying to hunt those rather than anything else and just try to use their bite force in there and their other teeth in order to try and secure a meal. It would obviously be a lot more difficult though and, and probably not ideal situation for any leopard to lose all four of its canines. It would be quite something though if they did because it would be a serious problem with their teeth 
if they lost all four, or they're making some poor career choices and feeding off the wrong things if they are losing teeth. Can you imagine a leopard gnawing on a rock and breaking all of its teeth? It would be quite something to see. But anyway, I'm pretty sure leopards are clever enough not to actually do any of that. Now, I wonder where all of our different lions are at the moment. I heard an update about in Kahumas actually being in Londolozi this afternoon or this morning should I say. So that's not ideal. They're very far away. I know the Birmingham's have forsaken our land. I don't know what we did to them to offend them but they've forsaken us and have headed south. So hopefully we'll have some sort of lion action at some point. I know the, the Voca boys came through but they went all the way back to Manuleti last night so it was just a brief sort of jaunt in during the middle of the night a la Birmingham style. Anyway, we'll carry on towards Twin Dam's treehouse, Janet Jackson's home. While we do that, let's send you back to Sydney and hopefully Hosanna is going to stir at some point this afternoon. Uh, great stories from uh, Tristan. Eh? Now I am still here and then uh, I can see that uh, Osana uh, is still very relaxed but I saw uh, he was stretching a little bit earlier on the past five minutes so maybe at any time from now uh, this leopard might uh, stand up and walk. It's just that I'm not sure if it's going to walk towards where the carcass is or going somewhere. So that is what I am interested to see. Yeah, because there by the tree is not much that is left there. So I'm not very sure if we still have got interest to go and finish completely or carry on towards somewhere. And these kind of animals, after a kill, remember, the the kill is very moisturized. So you might find that he's going to go to the water hole now because he caught the animal in the morning and he, he, he was able to survive for the whole day. And maybe it's now the right time for him to get some water a little bit. And I know now where I am going to find Osana in the next... Uh, a couple of hours or days, the droppings for Osana, the first one to come out after this kill, they are all going to be completely black, which is going to be, uh, which is going to make it very difficult to distinguish between these and other animals, because now when it's black, what is causing that black color is the amount of blood in the meat. So eating a lot of blood there tends the droppings to become very dark. Other animals, scavengers, such as the hyenas as well, if they scavenge something which is very fresh, and that is what we are going to see, you will see the first droppings to come out very dark black. So it will take uh, some uh, a couple of rounds for these lepers to be able to uh, give out the scat which is light in complete in, in 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 complexion I was just trying to uh, listen to what is happening around here but uh, it seems like the imbalance I saw earlier on decided to uh, avoid this area maybe he picked up a signal about uh, Osana here. Who knows? As I saw how they were coming down towards this side, they were not aware that Osana is here. Yeah, it's getting cold a little bit here by this uh, valley. Maybe this kind of uh, cold weather is going to activate uh, Osana to stand and show us her next move, his next move. You can see now he's stretching it. Eh? He was not doing this on the past uh, few sec few minutes. Maybe now is the time to stand up. I 
Yeah, let's go to uh, Tristan has just arrived by a train stand. Maybe there's something happening there. Well, let's see, Sydney, we are about to turn the corner to Twin Dam's glory. Let's have a look. And alas, no glory, I'm afraid. There is nothing happening by the looks of things. Let's just do a quick scan. I know that sometimes our leopards are sneaky and they sit on this damn wall and you can drive right past them if you don't look carefully. So let's have a look. No, alas, no leopard on the damn wall. Anything on the southern side of the dam? No, no, nothing there. Hmm, there's not even a bird here today. I would have thought we might have seen a lapwing or a three-banded plover, but I think everybody's decided it's a good night to be indoors. I suppose it's the start of the work week, so everyone's had a rough day at work after the Soccer World Cup final, and now it's time to have an early night in this cold weather. It's time for a soup and hot water bottle in bed. David, what do you think? Do you think that's where all the animals are? Is that what you're going to be doing tonight, David? David's going to be having soup and a hot water bottle tonight. That's what he says. Early night, David. Yes, okay, he's nodding his head. We've got an early start tomorrow, David, so an early night is a good thing to have. I think we should all partake in an early night and have a bit of a snooze because tomorrow morning will be another early day. It's not as early as the weekend. The weekend we had a rather a few early shifts, I would call it. When you when you are waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning in the dead of winter, there's something that just doesn't sit very well with that. It, it, some parts of my soul dies when I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning in the winter but you know what it's actually quite nice being out at that time it's, it's very strange to be out in the middle of the night and on Juma it's, you know it doesn't feel kind of normal and it's it's eerily quiet and beautiful at that time of the day albeit cold and funny enough it's actually not as cold as it is as sunrise comes up so when you first go out and you sort of hang on what is that now Give me two seconds. I see dung on the road, but I can't see what the tracks are for it. Very odd looking dung too. So I'm going to try and roll back a little bit and you can see it there in my spotlight. I'll take my light away so that David can show you what I'm talking about. It looks very much like an omnivore. Hmm, I wonder if it's maybe not a civet bits of scattered. It would be odd if it's a civet because civets usually have a civet tree where they'll go and defecate regularly in the same place. I want to just get a little bit closer now that you've seen it and see if I can see a track. I thought I saw a civet track in amongst it. That's why my immediate thought was civet but unfortunately it's very difficult at the time of the day to see tracks clearly. What are you? Yes civet track. So it is a civet that's defecated. It's not from tonight because the tracks Am I sure it's a civet? Hold on. Yes, it is a civet. There's also very old leopard tracks here too. Um, so, you know, at first I thought it might not be a civet, just given the fact that it was quite sort of open and on the road. Civets often do it right next to the road, not in the middle of the road itself. It's normally a kind of leopard that does something like that, but the leopard tracks are far too often to match that scat. And I say it's not a fresh civet track because the wind has absolutely destroyed that footprint, and so not easily recognizable at all. Right, Janet Jackson's home is just up above. Should we go and visit? Do you think Janet Jackson's in bed tonight, David, or do you think she's out on the town? As a celebrity Janet, as a celebrity Janet, one, you know, thinks that maybe, just maybe, she'll be out on the town. It's a, difficult to keep up a lifestyle as a celebrity Janet. So one, you know, does have to engage in all kinds of functions and various other things. But I would imagine that she was quite busy last night, or he, whichever one it is. I, you can never be sure with Janet Jackson as to which one it actually is. And I just saw some tracks going over the road, so I just wanted to double check, but it's for a kudu. Um, and so maybe she's, uh, you know, got a full roster this time of the year. Winter date maybe somewhere. You never know. It'd be nice to know if it's a male or a female, because I always refer to it as a she, but it could be a he and that might be very offensive. What should we, should we just call it an it, David? Janet Jackson is an it until further notice. I'm not sure she'll be that, or he will be that chuffed with being called it either. Right, the tree is up ahead here, it's just around this bend. Well, 
the next bend actually this bend then the next one and then it's that tree over there so we'll just have a little look now and see if she's home problem with Janet Jackson is it's always a, such a fleeting glimpse as you drive up because not the most relaxed Janet in the world so we're going to try and take it slow and steady and let's see do we get lucky tonight is there something there no there is nothing there I'm afraid not no Janet today oh wait there there is a tail I think David but now the next problem is is there a tail in there or is it just a branch it looks like a tail but I don't think David's going to be able to see it David let me go forward a bit and see if you can get those two little holes no you can't of course because the roof is going to irritate and ruin yes there is a tail but it is now gone upwards so never mind David the roof has ruined my Janet Jackson experience unfortunately and this is why I'm very much not a fan of these roofs anyway let's carry on to Treehouse Dam while we do that let's hope that Sydney's having more luck than what we are in finding what he's well he has found something but hopefully he's having more luck in terms of Asana waking up Uh, nice to hear that there has been some alarm call from the kudus on the other side where Tristan is and uh, I'm still here um, by uh, Hosanna hoping for Hosanna to wake up anytime soon oh, he's still lying down flat eh? And it's very much quiet here where I am. So this leopard, the chances for him to wake up, maybe he knows that there is no competition too much. He knows that this area is very quiet and no other scavengers are going to give him a problem. So I think if that carcass was on the ground, he was not going to sleep much longer like this because he was supposed to have now two different responsibilities a responsibility to sleep in order to let the digestive system to digest the food and another responsibility of guarding the carcass against the scavengers so it, it was going to be very tough so you can see that taking up a prey to a tree it gives them a good chance to rest without thinking about anything so this gives them at least an opportunity to rest all day long without being bothered by anything. So, but if everything was on the ground, if the prey was on the ground and he is also resting on the ground and the scavengers are also roaming around on the ground, it was going to be a little bit of a challenge to him to execute those two different responsibilities at the same time. It was not going to be easy. Yes, I've got a, a comment uh, about uh, Hosanna uh, to be active anytime soon. And that is my hope. I hope he's going to get up anytime soon. Yeah, I still have got enough time to wait and see his developments. And it's, it's, not, it's not disturbed by anything. Yeah, let's uh, let's go to Tristan. He's got an antelope to show you on the other side. I have a piping hot antelope on this cool afternoon, as shown by the Fleer camera. As you can see there, our waterbuck is having a little grooming session and is all on its lonesome. It's just one male waterbuck by itself, but is most certainly a glowing figure in amongst the trees of Juma Game Reserve. 
Now, I just thought I heard some jackals calling, so I was momentarily pausing. But they've gone quiet now. It would be nice if we could get some side-striped jackals. Maybe they're on quarantine. On the way home, we might get them. But what's interesting about this picture is that for all of you that think that horns have no sort of tissue inside them, that there's no blood flow inside there, you can see that there is warmth in those horns. So the horns are not cold. They're not just inanimate sort of objects or bits of sort of dead hair. They are actually alive and well, and they do have hot or heat coming through them. So there is blood that is going into some of the tissue between their keratin layer and the bone structure itself that's causing a bit of heat to light up, which is quite nice. So you can actually see horns on a antelope, which is very, very cool. And a few little hot spots on that. And I, what I would like to know, actually, and I think this would be quite an interesting thing, is obviously waterbuck have very long fur, much longer than most of the other antelope that we have here, and, and therefore should theoretically be far better insulated than the others. And I would like to know if we had a situation, and I wonder if we have, maybe some of you guys who have been on the drives when the flea arrived before I got here I have seen any images of waterbuck in amongst other antelope and whether there's a, a noticeable difference in temperature between the other antelopes and the waterbuck themselves and whether they are hotter or if they are appear actually cooler because of the insulating layer and I know James was discussing it with birds that feathers in his mind are far better insulation than fur and that birds should appear obviously a little bit cooler on the outside because they're insulating the heat a little bit. So it'll be interesting to kind of pick it up and, and see. Hopefully we can find some waterbuck in amongst some other antelopes. Chipto Dam would actually be a good place to test this theory and see how it actually works and whether or not there is a massive difference between a waterbuck and let's say an impala or any other animal. You can see it's a little spooked out by the fact that we're sitting here. It's amazing because it's so dark I can't even see that waterbuck from where I'm sitting without the aid of a light. But yet with this flare you can actually see every little detail. It's amazing to me that we have technology like this and to be able to use it in this setting. I know some people are not huge fans of it but for me it just opens up a whole new world that's so much less invasive than anything else. You know, we don't have to shine a light on this animal. We can still watch its behavior as we would during the day, but we're not in any way kind of disturbing it. Stefan, so the circle on his rump doesn't seem like it shows a hot spot. Of course, now he's going to go behind a tree so that I can't actually see what's going on. Oh, there's another waterbuck. He's not on his own. Look at that. How wonderful. There's a whole herd of waterbuck. He's not going to be a lonesome. Well, yes, there's the... You can actually see it, can, can't you? You can see the little circle on his rump, you see there? And it's warmer than the rest, which is interesting. That's very cool. Of course, he's going to go behind a bush. This is typical of my day so far, is that now that we want to look at its rear end, which sounds very odd when I say it, it's now going to go behind a bush where I can't actually see it. Come on, waterbuck, move. No, not that way, the other way. It's being painful, these waterbuck. They're not cooperating at all. David, can you think we can find another waterbuck's rump? No. I feel awkward by saying that I want to stare at a waterbuck's rear end. It feels very odd. Now, you can see in the, the infrared, which is the previous technology that we were using at night time, just how much better it is with the FLIR in able to see, in, well, in enabling us to see animals at night. It really is absolutely amazing. The range of how far we can see has just infinitely gotten better. And like I say, that means that we don't have to be as close to animals. It means that we can view animals at night in relative peace, that we don't disturb them. Absolutely incredible technology. Good. Well, our waterbuck have trotted off. Their rear ends are not wanting to be seen. And so I'm not going to be that awkward fella that just watches for a moment too long and is then kind of steamed to be a waterbuck stalker. In the meantime though, we're going to head off, I think, to Treehouse Dam. We should have enough time just to bypass there on our way to quarantine in search of the jackals. While we do that, it sounds like Hosanna has finally awoken from his afternoon slumber. Yeah, Hosanna is now becoming active. You can see now he's not lying down completely anymore. So you can see that maybe at any time from now, Hosanna might stand and show us the next move. Oh, but he's still looking very much uh, relaxed.
Yeah, so it means Hosanna ate a lot this morning, eh? Now he goes again. Hmm. I thought I was convinced enough that Osana is going to move to somewhere else now. Uh, this a uh, question for Messi. The lepers can sleep long hours, just that I'm not too sure exactly how many hours. But some other cats who, who got similar kind of behavior as the leopard, such as the lions, can sleep up to 18 hours. So the lepers, I'm not very sure how much time they can be able to sleep. Yeah, but now this shows me that uh, uh, Hosanna ate a lot this morning eh, because it's not even moving at all. I can't even see how much is in on in the stomach, but I can just see that the stomach looks full. So, but considering the size of the prey Hosanna took this morning, I can see that he ate quite a lot of meat because there's quite. Yes. Uh, Osana got to become territorial when they are at the age of about two and above. That is when they must have to now go and stand by them. They get kicked off when trying to challenge the dominant males. Yeah, then they must go now by themselves and see if they can establish their own uh, their their own uh, families. In other words, I'm just saying, in order to get hold of the mates. Yeah, it seems like there's something attracting Hosanna at this stage. I can see the ears. You can see the ears are, are moving, trying to concentrate. Full concentration is given to that side. Can see um, patience is is virgins eh, when it comes to these cats so coming to the cats there's no rush the cats always take their time look at that it's getting exciting eh? i'm so very much excited that suddenly hosanna is up Let's go to Tristan, uh, who is driving on the other side, and see what he got. Well, I am driving because I'm trying to see if I can find these jackals quickly. So I'm on quarantine now. I've kind of shown a little turn of speed to get here. So I'm just trying to see if we can find them quickly before we finish up this evening so far no sign of them again it seems as though they are morning jackals maybe they you know wait for the afternoon for the light to go down and then they come out I'm not quite sure but it seems like every morning it's okay to find them but in the evenings really struggle to see them um, no no sign unfortunately no sign of our jackals where I thought they would be and which is a shame, but while I sort of do one last quick scan, let's send you back across to Hosanna, who is up and moving. Yeah, Hosanna just uh, decided to uh, stand up now, just got disappeared somewhere behind these bushes here. So I'm trying to see 
if I can have a sighting from where I am, but I saw that his head was now facing towards the direction of where the the, the host tree for the prey is. But it's just somewhere here behind these bushes. Maybe maybe he's going to come out at any time somewhere here. Unless he's trying to scratch against the trees there. Interesting, eh? Interesting to see that this leopard, we have been waiting, hoping for him to stand up now. He stood up and God disappeared. Instead of coming out for us to see. Uh, Patrick, yes, um, is, is now Osana uh, growing big to become a big leopard, eh? Yeah, you can see that now uh, a Hosanna got disappeared and I don't think I will manage to get a hold of uh, a Hosanna anymore. So it, it has been a, a fantastic day. It was a lovely sighting. Uh, it was a lovely sighting with a Hosanna and uh, Hosanna now brought us to the end of our show and thank you very very much for your question and and comments uh, we will meet again tomorrow at half past six